Good morning and welcome to day two of the Female Tech Heroes Conference. Yesterday was an amazing first day. Already 700 people watched the recording I just saw. So today we're gonna make it even better, right? Of course. Of course. So if you haven't met us before, Female Tech Heroes is an initiative that strives to create more diversity in the tech world. We put female and male heroes in the spotlights. We create awareness about diversity and equality. And we try to bring our network together for dinners, for mentor sessions and for conferences like today. We have an amazing lineup, right? Absolutely, we have. We have Mindy Howard, who will train us like an astronaut for success. And we will dive into diversity in tech and why this matters with CPD Del Can from Smart Photonics. We will have an amazing talk about Frank Bayer, from Frank Bayer from the university in Eindhoven here, because they put all the female job applications on top of the stack. Isn't that great? Yeah, definitely. We will have a great talk of IBM, Evita Stoop, and um, she will talk about equality and new leadership. Um, and of course, we have two amazing panels about how to make diversity work and equality can wait. So we have a full morning and we will promise that the time will fly. Uh, before we go to, we fly to space, to Mindy Howard, we would like to know more about you. So we have a YouTube chat and uh, we would really like to ask you a question and you can just answer there because we are curious uh, who you are and why you are joining. But the first question is, who is your role model? I brought the iPad again, yeah. so we can watch it live, all your answers. So go to the live stream, to the chat, and you can just answer. Answer the question. Hilde, who is your, your role model? Oh, I have a lot of role models. Also, you, Ingelou. Me? You're one of the <laughs> role models. Yeah, I learned so much from you. I feel the same. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> About you. Uh, but for, for me, it's also my mom, for example. You know, a, a powerful woman who raised me and and uh, and taught me how to make uh, learned me a lot of things in in life. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I think. And, and maybe we can also ask the audience. Yeah, who are your role models? We have a few people who are speaking today. Who are your role models? Also, your yeah. mom. Yeah. I learned a lot from her, and uh, a lot of teachers that I had. Teachers, yeah. yeah. And uh, my colleagues, a lot, of, a lot of them. Yeah, and colleagues as well. That's yeah. really nice. Another one, role models here in the audience? I would say my dad. Your dad? Why? Well, I think he's, he's a different way of thinking and, and daring to do. A different way of thinking, yeah. Ah, it's your dad, your mom, your dad. That's nice. It's you. Is the app working as, as well? Yeah, we have Sonja Barend. Yeah. That's yeah. one of the role models. Yeah. Of Geertje Algera. Yeah. And also I see here my grandmother. Yeah. Because nice. she traveled to so many places. That's with nice her. too. Yeah. Yeah. Ah. Queen Maxima. Ah, Queen Maxima. Also yeah. one of the role models. My Reiki master. Okay. Also very interesting. Yeah, interesting. You so see that inspiration, role models yeah, inspiration comes from a lot of places. Yeah, it is, it is. And we have another question for you. Why are you joining today? Yeah, so write it down in the chat. What do you expect of today? Why are you joining us? And which part of the program maybe you're looking forward to? Yeah. It's good to know. And while you are answering, it's good to know that today we are trying to make it as interactive as possible. So if you have a question for our speakers, write them down in the chat and we'll make sure to ask as many questions as possible. Uh, are yeah, there and already for, uh, for Frank Bayers, I also see your colleague Karma van Veelstra as one of the role models. Yeah, also She's from the also, uh, yeah. mentioned. Ah. Uh, People like the whole lineup of day two oh, that's because good. they think day one was awesome. That's good to hear. So it's fantastic to be back again. Mindy, 
Yeah, Mindy. Well, she's up. So yeah, she's I think up. we're ready yeah. to start, Hilda. I think we are. You can we just are. write down in the chat while you're joining because we really like to read it. Thank you for joining today. Uh, we're going to make a really nice program and we're going to fly to space. So give a very big virtual applause to Mindy Howard. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, we will wrap up this Q&A, okay. Mindy. Uh, can I have one more big virtual applause <laughs> for Mindy? Thank you. Great to have you on Thank stage. You. And there are a lot of compliments in the chat, uh, uh, Mindy, terrific. for your talk. So Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Okay, may I invite CPD Kandan Del on stage, the technical project lead of Smart Photonics. Because we have two topics that we are focusing on this morning. It's diversity in e equality, and CPD will have a great ta talk on why diversity matters. Thank you. The floor Hilda. is yours. Thank you. So, um, like uh, Mindy, I actually have a background in engineering. Uh, I have a, a, a materials engineering degree and I studied nanotechnology. So, uh, being here, uh, here uh, giving this presentation is me outside my comfort zone. So, bear with me. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk about uh, diversity um, and why it matters. In uh, 1975, Stephen Sasson invented a digital camera at Kodak. At the time, uh, Kodak had actually a very uh, comfortable and stable business model, which was uh, making camera film. So their uh, executive management at that time decided that this innovation is not something that they see uh, worth pursuing, so they decided to actually cover it up. By the time that they realized that this uh, disruptive technology is actually something that can be their next big thing, uh, and they finally decided to go to market with it, uh, it was already so late that they could never actually capitalize on it. And in uh, 2012, uh, Kodak actually filed for bankruptcy. So missed opportunities uh, to me are a big indication why we actually need diversity. Uh, we need to make sure that we have the right people around the table to ask the right question and make the right decision. Bringing people uh, with different background actually help us to have more perspective and help us to make sure that we do our best to make a future uh, proof decision. Um, yeah, diversity in background, as I said, uh, brings in diversity in uh, perspective. Um, if this past year of pandemic showed us anything, that's how desperately we need uh, innovative actions to overcome all these sort of new challenges that uh, come uh, in our ways. The, the, if we make sure that we um, can have uh, talented and bright people who can uh, bring in new ideas and uh, realize these ideas and try to translate them into reality, uh, like f it, it will be a, a big win for uh, all of us. Um, yeah, as I said, um, talent um, comes in different uh, forms and shape. I mean, we have to make sure that we have an open eye for talent everywhere, simply because we cannot afford to miss out on uh, capable and qualified uh, people. People with uh, diverse background, they can bring in uh, diversity in thoughts, which basically is the, uh, the backbone of uh, all of these innovative actions that we need uh, moving forward. Um, uh, talking about diversity and, and paying attention to it can really help us make sure that we uh, we have a clear vision when we want to um, when we want to uh, bring in uh, new people in our to uh, into our communities, our organizations, and uh, try to help us really uh, broaden our perspective uh, in that sense. Um, diversity is important, but. Um, it does not and must not uh, come uh, with, uh, with the price of lowering uh, any bars. Uh, diversity is not about asking uh, organizations or companies to act as a charity organization and uh, bring in uh, unqualified people just to kind of look diverse or check a box. Quite the contrary. Paying attention to diversity is about uh, qualified, talented, and capable people who are uh, getting uh, overlooked or undermined just because they seem different than the mainstream or what is considered to be uh, normal. 
paying attention to diversity is not a, a random act of kindness. It's a viable business decision that can create a competitive advantage. Um, um, diversity is, um, as I said, um, is a, a diverse uh, word by itself. Uh, sometimes people think diversity is just about a, a limited group of people, but anybody in their uh, span of lifetime can become subject of diversity. We can talk about diversity in terms of nationality, ethnicity, religion, uh, I don't know, sexual background, uh, sexual orientation, educational background, or um, gender and age. Actually, the age diversity is something that uh, companies have already started to, uh, to look into and um, paying attention to. For example, um, uh, Gucci in 2015 started to uh, create these uh, shadow boards in which um, they pair a, a millennial employee with a, with a, a senior executive and uh, try to create, a, a, take advantage of this uh, age diversity that exists. I mean, for the first time in history, we have five uh, generations working at the workforce uh, at the same time. For Gucci, this uh, meant that uh, since 2015, their sales actually went up 136%. Um, and uh, another example of uh, putting diversity in action is, uh, for example, Nestle. Uh, Nestle is a company with products in every household. Uh, they decided that they need to put uh, gender diversity in, in, uh, in the heart of their uh, marketing ecosystem. Uh, since 2017, they uh, increased the um, number of uh, female um, senior uh, leaders in their marketing. Uh, they raised that uh, up to 50%. And since 2017 till 2020, their uh, net profit went up from 7 billion to 12.2 billion uh, yeah, uh, in Swiss francs. So, uh, yeah, the, paying attention to I, uh, diversity uh, is something that um, a lot of companies show that can or, uh, already show that it pays off. Um, there has been a lot of different sort of studies uh, around the topic of diversity. Like one of the, the most extensive one is done by Boston Consulting uh, Group. Um, they studied uh, a, a huge number of, uh, I think, uh, around 200 uh, different companies within Europe. And um, their uh, study uh, showed that um, all these companies that uh, have uh, diversity in their leadership uh, above 20%, they clearly show a, a trend in um, connection between having diversity in the leadership and uh, being more innovative. So it's a very clear and um, um, simple uh, indication that by increasing uh, diversity in the leadership, you can see a huge benefit in the um, uh, innovation. In, you can see a huge um, increase in uh, innovation uh, turnouts uh, within the company. But as I said, there is a threshold for, for this. You cannot just um, bring one, for example, women uh, within the leadership and expect some sort of a miracle to happen. We need to give the, that level of diversity a chance to kind of show its effect. Uh, companies like Apple, Alibaba, and J.P. Morgan, they all uh, they all already passed that 20% uh, threshold. Um, another point that I would like to uh, uh, another point that I would like to discuss is about um, uh, the change that we we kind of need to uh, think about uh, in terms of uh, increasing diversity. For example, in case of gender diversity. Uh, the number of uh, female uh, graduates that join the workforce is constantly increasing over time. So basically, uh, if somebody wants to look at it that way, uh, the pool to fish for female leaders is kind of getting bigger and bigger. But we don't really see that happening in, in real life, uh, and we, we really need to think about why that is. Um, Good leaders and good managers, they are not really born overnight. It's a result of hard work and also a chain of events. Like any other part of the business that we want to see result, we need to make sure that we can define measurable um, 
action points that we can uh, track and see if uh, we really see the result that we are looking for. For example, SAP, a uh, software company, uh, they, they kind of did this, this, uh, used this approach. They increased, uh, they defined clear action points and, and trace those actions, and by that they um, defined uh, certain targets to impre improve the um, percentage of uh, women in their leadership. And uh, they basically achieved those goals, for example, in two from 2011 to 2017, they went from 19% women in leadership to 25%, uh, and now they have a new target, uh, which is increase the number of um, uh, women in leadership position by 30% uh, by uh, 2022. Um, I think we need to create uh, systems that can select, develop and promote based on uh, talent, capability and qualification. We, need, we really need to make sure that we clearly see every individual and uh, we don't really uh, ignore or uh, overlook uh, people uh, because of, I don't know, bias, uh, misjudgment, or uh, wrong assumption. So we really need to make sure that, that uh, we uh, give um, people equal access to opportunity. To me, equal access to opportunity is really key to drive uh, diversity. For uh, centuries, um, women uh, really had a lot of difficulties to fully get engaged in their societies and their communities. There, there are a lot of various reasons for that. For example, from feminine issues like um, having access to sanitary products, uh, pregnancy, childcare. Um, it was only um, in early 1900 that the idea of uh, having public daycare become a, become a thing, or uh, it was only in the 60s that women get access to, uh, or gain access to contraceptives, which basically help them to plan their pregnancies. For a lot of women, these sort of issues are still uh, exist. Um, so, yeah. These sort of issues and also um, uh, barriers in terms of uh, civil rights. Women had to fight for, for getting the right to, to vote, to educate them, to, to get education, to own property, to uh, even get uh, equal rights in marriage. A lot of different barriers uh, was on their way to become um, or become able to uh, actively get involved in their society, in the society and the, uh, their communities. So this resulted in a, a male dominance in a lot of different aspects of our lives. Men uh, were the, the ones who basically uh, uh, wrote the rules by which the world operates and they are the ones who define what is uh, success or what is a good leader. Uh, so all of this were defined by them. Um, I'm not saying this as, as if there's something wrong with the male perspective. My whole point is that um, the perspective of half of the population was not really uh, considered in all of these um, uh, all of these points. Um, thankfully, this sort of situation is uh, already started to change. So. We already have uh, great women who not only really mastered these rules to be part of the game, but they also changed it, uh, changed it uh, for better. Um, I, I, I remember there was a sentence in uh, Melinda Gates' uh, book, uh, The Moment of uh, Left. Uh, she was talking about uh, gender equality in the society and she was talking about the fact that uh, if you're not brought in, you get sold out. So I think it's really important that we remember we need to uh, make sure that we are all part of the, uh, the equation when we want to think about uh, moving forward. Um, that's basically when we can make sure that we can make the most uh, out of uh, our situation. Um, this whole, um, as I said, this whole debate about women being more involved is not uh, to create a sort of a, like a power grab competition, just to make sure that we are all part of the discussion. 
Um, yeah, as, as I said, in recent years, we are already seen uh, great uh, role models and examples uh, of women being involved in different uh, aspects of the, the society, in politics, policy making uh, roles in uh, science and technology, healthcare, uh, academia, um, media. So there are courageous women that not only uh, challenge the status quo, but they also uh, change the course of history uh, one brave step at a time. Um, I want to finish my talk by uh, talking about a uh, sense of belonging. I, 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 I don't know, but this picture that I picked might come as a surprise to you, but I'm sure you can relate to the story behind it. Here you can see a picture of uh, Princess Diana uh, in the early 1980s. Um, she was actually known to make statements through her fashion uh, choices. Here you can see her wearing a red jumper with um, a dozen of uh, white sheep and uh, one uh, black one standing out. Um, it was known that she made uh, this bold move to show how she was uh, viewing herself within the British royal family, the odd one out. We, we really talk about diversity a lot, but I think uh, we need to make sure that we don't uh, miss on uh, the topic of inclusion. Uh, we, we really need to uh, make sure that we uh, don't forget that people uh, do their best when they feel like they are seen, they are given the chance to show what they've got, and they are able to, and they are appreciated for what they bring to, to the table. So for every diversity story to become success, a great uh, or a true sense of belonging is key. So if we want to really give diversity uh, a chance to show its benefit, we, we all really need to kind of try our part to make sure that the, uh, we are conscious about this, we are uh, giving, uh, giving it a chance, and we, uh, we should all try to do our best to help diversity become a success story. Thank you very much. Wow, Sepede, thank you for sharing your insights and examples. Thank why you. Why diversity is so important. And although it's out, your, out of your comfort zone, <laughs> you did a great job. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> and we also need to thank you for helping us with the program of today. It was because a you did, together with, uh, together with Helen Cardan, who's also in the, in the audience. Thank you, ladies. Um, it was a pleasure. Yeah. Uh, Sepede, can you tell us a little bit more about your own career? Uh, because I think you're a female tech hero also yourself. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, my background is in uh, materials engineering. So I, I got my bachelor's degree in, uh, in my hometown of Mashhad in Iran. And it was in 2010 that I uh, moved to Stockholm, Sweden to pursue my master's studies in uh, nanotechnology. And uh, my, actually my dad was the main reason that I did that. <laughs> made that decision, he really um, encouraged me to broaden my perspective and uh, go abroad and don't l limit myself to the environment that I was in. So that was when I, I moved. And um, I um, had the possibility to also work in the States for a year, and uh, I also worked in Germany, and since 2018, I'm based in the Netherlands. I joined TNO, uh, that was the, the reason that I moved to, to the Netherlands, and since last year in August, uh, I'm with Smart Photonics. And can you tell us a little bit more about your job within Smart Photonics? Yeah, sure. I worked as a technical project lead. So in our company, we, um, we make uh, integrated photonic circuit. We work with different customers. And uh, in order to make sure that we, uh, we clearly understand the needs of the customer and we make sure that we can really uh, uh, provide what what needs to be done, specifically because in our field, everything is really new and there is a lot of uh, different aspects that needs to be considered. Uh, for each customer project, we have a, a special 
technical project lead assigned to it to make sure that we uh, have a very clear uh, understanding from customer perspective and also make sure that every everything regarding that project is run uh, within the company smoothly. So it's a very um, interdisciplinary uh, role, I would say. You need to be uh, working with the sales, with the R&D team, uh, with the production. So yeah, it's, it's, it's very, it's challenging, but I, uh, I really like it. Yeah, and I've also heard that you're a kind of diversity specialist within <laughs> Smart Photonics, <laughs> your own company. Can you tell us a little bit more about um, that? I'm not, I'm not going to go as far as saying a specialist, but uh, I may be diversity enthusiast. I, I talk exactly. about it and uh, I uh, make sure that um, uh, we keep the dialogue open around it and make sure that we um, understand the benefit of it and have a right approach towards it. And how's the male-female balance within uh, your it's, company? It's, it's, it's really good, I, I would say. I mean, we already have a, a, a big portion of uh, our company with uh, great uh, women, actually, not in, uh, in one department, in uh, all the departments. We, we really have great uh, women uh, uh, working together. Yeah, because you're growing very fast yes, as a company. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Zepede. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much. Yeah, give her again a big applause. <laughs> Frank Bayens, may I invite you to the stage? Because The Guardian wrote, it's what students look for, the Dutch university that's only hiring women. But okay, we need to nuance this a little bit more. But fortunately, joining us today is the Rector Magnificus of the Eindhoven University of Technology, Mr. Frank Bayers. He will talk about their special program to put female job applications on top of the stack. Give him a big applause. The floor is yours, sir. Thank Frank. you very much. So I'm, I'm very happy to explain uh, the initiative that we have taken uh, to, uh, to improve the gender balance at, at our university, the Eindhoven University of, the, uh, of Technology. Uh, it was our way to, to see if we could improve uh, gender equality. That ultimately is the goal that we have. Um, throughout my uh, professional life, I've been active in science and, and technology, both in the private sector as well as in the public sector. Actually, I worked at this campus for quite a while. Um, the way scientists uh, attack a certain uh, problem is in a very specific way. Uh, what we typically do, we formulate a hypothesis, uh, then we gather data, we interpret data, and on the basis of that data, we draw a rational conclusion. That's what we do. Um, that's also the way we review manuscripts that are being submitted to, for publication. We go for the best manuscripts. Uh, also, if we select uh, a proposal that up for granting, we go for the best proposal. And if we have a, a job interview and we have a vacancy in our academic uh, staff, we look at the resumes of individuals and we have interviews and we go for the best candidate. That's the way we do things in science. Now that image was shattered on the 15th of November in 2015. And that day, I was invited by the Koninklijke Hollandse Maatschappij de Wetenschappen, sorry for all the Dutch, in Haarlem, for a small dinner. Uh, I was there with a couple of uh, fellow rectors, uh, a number of policy makers, as well as the Minister of uh, Education, at that time, Jet Bussemakers. And during the dinner, uh, Professor Naomi Elmers uh, presented uh, scientific results, overwhelming scientific results, that demonstrated that we all are affected by an implicit gender bias. Whenever we use words like best, excellent, outstanding, those words are easily attached to males and far less attached to females. And unconsciously, that is affecting the way we take decisions. We are all, men and women alike, affected by this implicit gender bias. So that changed the image that I had of the process that we use. And then uh, um, a couple of years later, so, uh, well, after the, di after the dinner, I, I approached uh, Naomi and I asked her whether she would be willing to present that data at my institution as well. And that set in motion a whole sequence of events. 
Um, and ultimately, in 2019, we had a unique opportunity to make a difference. Uh, we were facing a situation where we had a, a relatively large number of vacancies in a relatively short period of time. Say in about a two-year time span, we would have 150 vacancies in our academic staff. The total staff uh, size is about 600, so 150 is a significant number if you compare it to that. So we wanted to make a change, and we wanted to take a positive action, and then we, took it, we basically took the initiative to specifically address this implicit gender bias, exactly in the way as The Guardian mentioned it, by putting the female applications on top of the stack. That is the Irene Curie Fellowship Program. And I'll try to explain it to you. So why we did we do it? How did we do it? And what is the result? Now, I was preparing a lecture about this program about a year and a half ago uh, for Max Planck uh, Institute, and I came across a special edition of The Lancet. And The Lancet is one of the top journals in the medical field. And it was addressing gender equality issues in the healthcare sector. And there's also an editorial with it. And I have three quotes from this editorial, and I will read them for you. Um, it says, it is well established that women are underrepresented in position of power and leadership, undervalued, and experience discrimination and gender-based violence in scientific and health disciplines across the world. I read this and got to my throat. This is happening to my wife. She's a scientist. This is happening to my daughters. And this is happening to many of you. And if I would have said that this quote was from a century ago, you probably would have said, yeah, could be. This is happening today. This is 2019. And many of us are affected by this. They also said that, and I think uh, some of the results that we've seen this morning point in this direction as well, diverse and inclusive teams lead to better science. We simply cannot afford to miss out half of the intellectual power that we have. We need that. And to, have a, to make a change, you have to do it at the institutional level. So all of that basically kind of like we felt it supported the action that we've taken. We also know that if we really want to make a change, then a minority is no longer considered a minority if you exceed a 30% threshold. This is a science paper that, that investigated that in detail. So we said, okay, that's why we have this ambition that we should at least have 30% of our faculty to be female. So that's the ambition that we have because we know once we have exceeded that threshold, there's a sort of an automatic process and everyone is becoming part of the system. Today we don't have that, and so you, you clearly see the struggle that we have in the, in the community. So how about gender diversity at my institution and in the Netherlands, if you like? Now, this is uh, clearly a beautiful image, uh, relatively young female uh, professors, and this uh, image was taken uh, with the middle, uh, Ilya Foots, uh, when she had her inaugural uh, lecture. But reality is more grim. Great men, like me. Eh? That's what you see on this image, one female candidate. So that's a bit more the reality that we have today. Another example thereof, these are mid-career scientists, uh, that can apply for a prestigious grant. The VD grant is considered to be a very prestigious uh, grant. And this was in 2018. We were quite happy that we had seven uh, VD laureates, but only one of them was female. If you look at the percentage of female professors in the Netherlands, uh, this is what you get. I hope you, many of the abbreviations you may not understand, but this is the Eindhoven University of Technology and this is the Open University. To give you an example, so we're clearly at the tail end of, of, of the Netherlands. Eh? We have a, in 2018, we only had 15% of our pro full professors were female, which is kind of like typical in the engineering domain because it's pretty similar to what you see in uh, Twente and in, uh, in Delft, but nevertheless, way too low. If you look at the percentage of female professors in the Netherlands compared to what we have in Europe, the Netherlands is really at the tail end of Europe. So how can that be? Totally unfair. This is a, a rather embarrassing example of the implicit gender bias that we have in the Netherlands. Uh, it was published in the uh, NRC uh, a couple of years ago in 2019, 
we have the ability to award a, 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 a PhD thesis with a, a cum laude. And we typically reserve about five, five to six percent of all the theses that are awarded at cum laude. That's what you see across the universities in the Netherlands. So it's really an exceptional performance. Um, and then they investigated, okay, how, how is the distribution between the male and female candidates? And clearly the probability that a male candidate receives a cum laude is about twice as high as a female candidate. How can that be? There were two exceptions. The exception is in, uh, in Maastricht and in Tilburg. And they have a different procedure. In all universities, including mine, the promoter was taking the initiative to propose cum, cum laude. In Maastricht, and also to some extent in Tilburg, the committee is, promote, is, is uh, uh, proposing a cum laude. Apparently, that is a much more balanced process because in, in, in Maastricht, it's almost uh, a 50-50 balance between males and females. We've seen that, and uh, we've now adjusted our process uh, pretty much in line with uh, what Maastricht is doing, and we have to wait a couple of years to see whether or not that uh, ultimately results in a better balance. But here you can also clearly see that because th someone has to take the initiative and apparently is biased towards uh, the male candidates. Looking at the, uh, the numbers in the Netherlands, it's uh, quite often each year is being reported by the uh, Vrouwelijke Hoogleraren uh, Netwerk. Uh, um, at the undergraduate and graduate level, there's almost an equal uh, participation of males and females. But as soon as you make a career in science, apparently there's something happening. Now, part of it can be explained because it takes a while before people after their PhD uh, become full professor. In the Netherlands, it takes, on average, about 18 years. So part of it can be explained because of a time delay, but not everything. Uh, if I look at my own institution, uh, we typically now have about 30% of our students as uh, female. Why not 50%? Uh, at the assistant professor level, we see a gradual increase as a function of time, but at the associate professor level, we saw a decrease. And that was largely because we were promoting individuals to a full professor level, uh, but there was clearly an issue. And, and we also see that today, uh, at, at, the, that, at the point that we measured this in 2019, we had about 16, 70% of our professors was female. This should have been a much larger percentage if we would have done our normal job normal hiring procedure, normal uh, promotion procedure. So we tried many things. Um, we have a specific uh, women in science uh, program. We've set annual targets for the deans, uh, a 50% target for new hires. All of that was kind of like implicit. Uh, we agreed upon it, but we never really enforced it, if you like. But then the one thing that we didn't address was this implicit gender bias. The way we look at males, the way we look at females is different. And this is an example I've taken from Athena's Angels uh, website. Typically, if you look at the results of a, of a male, you say, well done, brilliant. Uh, if you look at the results of a female, yeah, you've done well, but. Why this but? <laughs> if it's a good result, it's a good result. So that's why we launched this uh, Irene Cree Fellowship Program, but really, putting the female applications on top of the stack. So we had this opportunity, 150 vacancies, and the target that we have, the long-term target, is to have at least 30% uh, females in our academic staff at the assistant associate and full professor level. So we take the program, it's a five-year program, and uh, this is what we did. We said the first six months, you can only invite female applicants you can only interview female applicants. That's what's the measure that we took. Six months may seem a long time, but if you realize in academia, it can take up to one or two years before we hire someone. So six months is still a relatively short period of time. Um, so we advertised these vacancies in the Irene Cree Fellowship Program, and it was explicitly stated that it was open to female candidates only. How many males applied? 50%. <laughs> Incredible, right? <laughs> so if during this uh, period of six months uh, the people were unable to find a suitable candidate, then it, the, the vacancy was open to males as well, and you could interview male and female candidates as you like. 
again, if they would, would, they would be of equal quality, then the female should be higher. Uh, that's, uh, that's the measure that we took. There was also an opt-out uh, opportunity. Uh, so, well, sometimes you see there's uh, an outstanding candidate uh, coming by and you really have to jump on the candidate because otherwise yeah, the, the candidate is gone and so forth. So we said, uh, yeah, if you have such a situation, you can come to me and I had a small committee and we look, we'd look at the uh, application and see, yeah, this is indeed uh, a special case and uh, you can hire the male even though you're in the process of hiring a, a female. So how often did that happen? Once. <laughs> Which shows that the female candidates that they were interviewing were really of the quality that they were looking for. If they were not, they should not have been hired because they would, would just have waited another six, a uh, couple of months and then they would have had the opportunity to hire the male candidates. That did not happen. So what did we offer? Um, the startup package that we had available, a specific 100K uh, to get uh, in particular young scientists started. The, the, one, the most difficult part in starting an academic career is to get your first grant. So we provided some initial startup package. Academic independence, which is the one unique selling point that we have. It's not really the salary. Uh, I work in the private sector so that I know what the differences are. But it's the academic independence that stands out. Uh, a mentoring uh, scheme, and we also paid uh, specific attention to dual career opportunities because uh, quite a large uh, number of scientists have a spouse which are as active in science as well. And if we could, we would try to see if we could accommodate that and help that, both within the institution but also in the, in particular in the Brainport area where, where there are so many uh, vacancies. Uh, we have a diversity and inclusivity um, roadmap, a training, a de-bias training. And the other thing that we did, we had an indication that there would be a, a pay gap between males and females in academia. So there was a strong indication that that's the situation in the Netherlands. So already uh, three or four years ago, we made the first analysis of that, and we could not prove it. And last year, we did another uh, pay gap analysis done by an external agent, which has a lot of experience with that, and they said, we cannot prove a pay gap at your institution. I'm very happy with that, because that's something... At the same time, this is something that you can easily solve. Uh, if it's a pay gap, you know what to do. But we do not have a pay gap, which shows that apparently, as soon as you're in, there's no significant difference between males and females. And clearly, we have a diversity officer uh, for our academic uh, staff as well as uh, for the students. Now, this <laughs> program got an enormous amount of attention. I didn't expect it at all, to be quite honest. I thought the local newspaper of the university would be uh, on top of it and perhaps uh, uh, the Eindhoven's Dag Club, uh, but that would be just about it. It turned out to be completely different. It got worldwide attention. Uh, I didn't expect that at all. Uh, Nature Science, uh, The Guardian, you name it, there was, it was all over the place. Um, and, and, it, and it really, I think, uh, um, was, was heartfelt by, by many people. It really generated a lot of emotion, things that I didn't expect, to be quite honest. Both in a positive way, people felt, yeah, we have to do something. We've been struggling with this for so many years. Someone has to try something different. And this is a different approach of all the other things that we've done. Uh, so there was support, uh, but there was also huge criticism. Uh, so you, at, the, at both ends of the spectrum, uh, you would uh, see uh, things uh, People felt it was a true uh, discrimination and any form of discrimination should be avoided and so forth. But what's the result? So after 18 months in this uh, program, we have a 50-50 hiring balance. We've never had this before. There was always like 10, 20% of the faculty that we hired were females. Now we have a 50-50 balance. So clearly not all vacancies were, were able to find female candidates. And some of them had to wait for six months. But it, at the end of the day, it's a 50-50 balance. If we would be able to do this for the next couple of years, we would really make a difference to the university. And, all, and all of them are good uh, candidates, because otherwise they should not have been hired. There was no quotum, eh? so it's not the quotum. It's really putting the female application on top of the stack. And this has really accelerated uh, the share of female scientists at the university. So we started this initiative in 2019. We had a relatively modest uh, growth, if you like, and we see a significant acceleration. And if we would be able to do this for the next couple of years, then 
you can see that within the two or three years we would be able to reach this 30% threshold that we are targeting. Not at all departments, unfortunately, so that will take a little bit more time, but at the same time, that's the ambition that we have. Unfortunately, there was a complaint filed with the Human Rights uh, Committee. Um, and, and they concluded that we basically had gone just a little bit too far by essentially placing all vacancies in this Iranic Career Fellowship Program. Um, so we, uh, we, we, we talked with them and we interpret the, uh, uh, the, uh, the ruling that they had. Um, it's, it's a non-binding ruling, but nevertheless we felt that we had to comply with it. And, and so we came up with an alternative. We said, okay, and they only at those locations within the university where we have a significant underrepresentation of females, so not lower than the 30% threshold, then we can have at least half of all the vacancies placed in the ICF program. Now, actually, there's only one department that meets this threshold. All the other departments are below the 35% uh, threshold, which essentially now means that 50% of all the vacancies that we have are being placed in this ICF program. And then the same rules apply that we had before. Whether this will lead to this 50-50 uh, distribution is something that we have to wait for, but uh, at least it's something that we can do. So in summary, I think the program in itself is very effective. So we have this 50-50 hiring uh, today, uh, and we're really looking forward to, to what's going to happen with all the new hires that we have, but, but time will tell. It does help in getting a better gender ba balance within the university. And I think it ultimately leads to a much better gender equality within the institution. Uh, an additional side effect, I think, is that if you look at the hires that we have today, 70% uh, of them are international. So we see a lot of talent being drawn into the university. And, and in, in a way, I think uh, the composition, in, at least in the academic staff that we have, kind of like reflects what you see within uh, Philips, uh, ASML, which is also a very international community. And that's what we have as well. And we actually, we, we, we like that because we are training our students to work in the kind of setting that you have within the Brainport uh, region. Now, the adjusted uh, program now has approval of the uh, Human Rights Committee, and the target remains uh, to have more than 30% of our academic staff to be female. Now, with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. I hope I've been able to explain uh, the program, what the outcome of the program was, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you so much for, for joining your inspiring story. We read a lot of responses from people uh, mm -hmm. that every university should follow your lead. Um, in a few minutes, we'll go to a, a break first of 10 minutes, and then we'll talk further in a sure. panel how to make diversity work. So if you have a question for Frank Bayens, ask them in the chat, and we will try to answer as many as possible in the panel. Uh, Frank will join the panel with Mindy Howard, with Arnaud de Jong uh, of TNO and Helen Cardan of ASML. So we have a 10-minute break, so maybe nice to go outside for a little bit of a while if it's not raining. Uh, take a coffee or tea, and we'll see you in 10 minutes. Thank you.
Welcome back and we will continue day two of the Female Tech Heroes Conference. We know now why diversity matters and I think we already knew that a little bit. We need to tap into the intellectual power of all genders and diversity goes beyond gender. It's about age, religion, ethnicity, work experience, cultural background and more. But how do you make diversity work? We will talk about this with Frank Bayens and Mindy Howard who are just on stage. Welcome again. With Arnoud Jong, Managing Director, TNO Industry. Welcome. And Helen Cardon, Senior Account Manager at ASML. Welcome. Uh, Minnie, what do you think of the, of the talk of Frank? Yeah, I've, I was very inspired to hear it and, and also kind of reflecting and thinking that it's not the Teju Eindhoven I remembered from <coughs> 30 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, because she did your PhD there, so you know how it feels. Yes. I, I do, and I, and I remember being one of the few female uh, students there, and I was so surprised, thinking like, where are all the women back then? You know, yeah. to me, it, I had, when I went to uh, engineering school in the States, there were at least 30% of the women, and, and it wasn't the case here. So th the fact that this is being addressed um, in, a, in a more, um, I would say, aggressive way now, finally, to a kind of address the, the imbalance, I think is a, is a, good, uh, is a good thing. But would you apply for, for a function if, if uh, the resumes of, of women were put on top of the stack? I would love to apply for <laughs> a function <laughs> where, I mean, I, can, I can't say I've ever experienced anything like doors welcoming me for any p sort of positions. Um, so I think it would be fantastic. It'd be a nice change, let's put it that way, yeah. um, instead of trying to break down doors that I've had to break in in the past. So um, yeah, I think it's, it would be great. <laughs> uh, Frank, you just told us about the Irene Curie Fellowship Program and um, I had a, per a personal question as well for you because um, I'm curious how it feels for you, how, how it was it to stick your neck out like this? Well, not, not very complicated actually because we were really convinced that we had to do something. It was something also that we had discussed at length uh, within the board of the university uh, with the dean. So there was a whole process that, that preceded this. I tried to explain that. So everything started in this particular meeting in 2015. And then we had a, a sequence of events at the university discussing uh, this implicit uh, gender bias. And at some point in time, we had to do something. And I, I really felt the sense of urgency that this was a time where we could make the difference. Uh, actually, this, uh, the, the whole idea was uh, created on a Saturday night, uh, sitting uh, in front of the TV and thinking about this. And I thought, you had to do something, and then this was being proposed. You talked about it with your wife, right? Yeah, on actually, the couch. Yeah, my, yeah, my wife is a professor at the university as well, and, and quite often when I have these wild ideas, I, she's the first person to of reflect course, with. Of course, yeah. <laughs> and then she criticizes it, of, of course. Um, and, and, but and what then did you I say about this idea? Well, she liked it uh, because, well, like I said, the, the first statement I had is the first quote I had from The Lancet. It is something that if you ask it, the female scientists, they all have experienced something like that. Not necessarily to, uh, to the degree that was sort of in that statement, uh, but they've all had experiences like that. And, they, and, and so taking a, 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 an action, a affirmative action, if you like, I think is something that many uh, uh, support, but uh, there are also others that do not support it at all. Uh, even within our university, there are female scientists that are completely against the program. Mm. You have to realize that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can, because uh, yeah. Can I just sort of say yeah. maybe there's you know maybe this sort of needs a makeover a, a little bit um, in the way you just that you just you use words positive action and I've heard positive discrimination um, mm. and and, by, and I was thinking back in the mm. diversity days when I was a consultant. Um, we, you know, this this always would come up. Um, like this sounds like positive discrimination. I, I have a s I made a slide. Yeah, we have a and slide. I would, we can I would ask love our if you technical could staff show to this put slide. it on. Um, and really, the differences of what positive discrimination are versus positive action. Because to me, this is clearly positive action, which is lawful. It is based on you know. Um, on the merit of the person mm -hmm. who is applying. So positive discrimination on it is something completely different. It's, it's, not, it's not lawful, but also it's not based on merit. So you say, okay, I want a person, I want a woman in this case, doesn't matter if she's qualified. And, um, and then you would have quotas maybe to say, um, doesn't matter about the qualification, we just need to get women on seat. And that's not at all what this is. This is positive action. Um, and the targets are based purely on we want to get you know a woman on the seat, but but it's, she's got to be the best, she's got to be qualified, and we need to look a little bit harder. And that whole idea of 
the, the word discrimination, as soon as I hear it, I think, no, it's not. It's positive action, and there's a com it's completely different. So I don't know, maybe you could talk more uh, you know, in your communications with you know, making, that, making sure that people understand it is not discriminatory at all. But it is there, yes, there is a preference. Yep. And, oh, you know, and of course, and if there's no women that they can find for whatever reason, okay, then the, the men yep. can apply. Yep. But big difference yep. between yeah. targets <coughs> and quotas. Yeah, it's, it's, it's certainly not a quotum, eh, because the quotum is a very different situation. Exactly. The quotum would be that you would say, okay, 50% of the position have to be female. And you wait until you found a female candidate. That's what the quota means. Right. You don't, you, you, so you don't fill the, the position. And, and uh, you, there's, 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 you can have good reasons to have a quota as well, because that, and that's really debated in the Netherlands uh, for a number of positions where they actually enforce a quota also to make a positive first step. But here it was really ruling out this implicit gender bias for at least six months. That was the whole idea. <laughs> and, and, and so the individuals that have been hired should not have been hired if they did not meet the qualifications. So apparently, in a large number of cases, we were able to find top female scientists, top talent that fits the, 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 the description that we mm. have, and then they, they hired them. The other thing that happened in this whole program is that we, the, re, the way we recruit scientists has improved significantly. So how does a soccer team find new talent in the, in the team that they have? They actually scout talent, and then they approach talent, and then they develop it, and then they put it in the first team. This is basically what's happening within the university today as well. Mm. So I think the whole recruitment process implicitly has been improved sure. as well. You have to look at every aspect. You're and writing the job description. Is it female friendly? Exactly. Are there things in there that yeah. women would be like, oh, I don't want this job, yeah. just because of the way it's written. Yeah. So looking at and, all and those processes. They now objectively look at the scientific results that someone has yeah. had, and they say, this is really a talented individual. They approach the individual and try to attract it to the university. So that in itself already, I think, is a significant uh, improvement. Yeah. Uh, but I, I really hope that we can maintain this 50-50 uh, balance in the hiring process. Someone is also asking, I would like to ask you, Arnaud, your managing director of TNO Industry, someone is asking, uh, could the same approach be applied in a company? What do you think? Yeah, well, uh, currently I'm not working in a company, but I've been CEO of a company uh, in the Netherlands. Um, so I think absolutely yes. I like the positive action, actually, the idea. I think that's also what, yeah, what companies, organizations uh, need today. Uh, I mean, it's uh, we're 2021, eh? so uh, I mean, you, you can. The easiest thing, by the way, as a leader, is to listen to your people. I mean, maybe in former times, I don't know how it worked, but of course, and you should always listen. It's not democracy, maybe, but still, it's very important to really sense, you know, what's going on in an organization. And I think that the target setting is, 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 in my opinion completely right uh, I'm, I'm um, because there is of course let's say the struggle of how to get it done uh, I mean you can let's not discuss uh, maybe the why because I'm fully convinced and many hopefully are and those who are not they won't get far in the careers in my view so that's easy yeah but the it's how to make it but work. how to make it work exactly yeah. and and I think we live and also as managers uh, you live in a world and I think that's right, uh, that, that you, you look at your metrics, you, 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 you measure things, you are confronted with figures and how are you compared to your targets. Uh, and how logical you do it with your order intake. Yeah, everybody understands this. Oh, we, are, we have to work harder because the order intake is too low. And here it's a s similar thing. And, and, um, and, and, and I think it still needs a little bit more push to get it in metrics, because you have to measure it maybe differently, not, not only with the 50-50 the functions example or your, your targets, but also to, uh, to reward maybe to get there. Yeah? So you have to find ways and to push it. Uh, and, and, and But first of all, it starts with simply putting it on the agenda, I will call it, yeah? and, and to, to really measure it. Uh, uh, and also confront uh, leaders or managers or you know, in organizations, uh, where are we? Where are we? And, and um, um, work off the target. Yeah? And that's, that's, uh, that's uh, the organizational way to deal with it. And, and how is this uh, where you work? Uh, well, um, at TNO, um, uh, we, we have clear targets. That's also very visible. I think, by the way, to communicate on targets is, is also very important because uh, we don't achieve them 
to 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 a very small extent we don't achieve it so it's a good target yeah because if you if you ask me to jump over one meter 50 i probably can but two meters something would be difficult you know so but you have to put a realistic target uh, but not too low um, uh, and i think at, at tno uh, another important thing i see is that um, well, i've introduced it but it's 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 also trainings of of management to look at your own biases because everybody has them there's no no issue with that but at least to get that awareness i think that's very important uh, and, and and also one element yeah i just mentioned also is ask what what the people want yeah and uh, and and then you get a clear answer so that uh, that whole works very well um one thing that tino think is doing well is 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 having a i call it a kind of a strategic goal to get there yeah? so organizations can be you can say i avoid the topic yeah that's maybe the lower end of the scale and 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 the upper is is something like fully inclusion but the way to get there or for for the spectators that side of course you move up and tino's putting there uh, uh is aiming for something that we are not at the moment but you have and to take steps to get there to steps yeah. to get there yeah and and it should also not be immediately we're not targeting for the upper uh, right part eh? so so but a realistic target uh, for the next uh, period to come to get there and we call it then a strategic uh, position uh, and I, can i yeah. just say yes, that i mean it, i think numbers are really good to look at in order to measure your progress from where you start and where you're going but Seppi Day mentioned the whole inclusion side of the story, which mm -hmm. is that's what's going to keep people there. I mean, so you could buy people in. Um, they, well, they maybe not always, but uh, they, often. Want, they want have to want to stay, you know? Yeah, yeah. No. so that whole sort of like, does it feel good to be working here um, as a woman uh, or yeah. whatever the you know the diversity measure is but you know you want you want to definitely sort of get that feeling of it feels good to work here and that whole inclusive um, message is just as important as looking at the numbers and measuring to me the inclusion is what you want to work on and the diversity is what you know is kind of more a lagging indicator what you're you know the numbers of where we are but you're working the inclusiveness um, thing about how it feels you know are people able to bring their whole self to work that sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. Like Sepire also said, like they belong, you know? Right. Feels uh, good. Helen, how do you look at this perspective? How to make diversity work? And, and for example, how is this going within ASML? Well, first of all, I say I'm just listening here and enjoying all <laughs> the <laughs> aspects of diversity uh, discussed here. Um, I think we, we, we what also mentioned here, diversity is about the sense of inclusion, looking at people below the skin, you know, looking at uh, their mental, so they're diverse in my opinion, the couple of aspects like, so you have uh, cognitive diversity, you have uh, personality diversity, and also uh, gender diversity, because at the end we are man or woman. One of these, uh, um, and and or combination else. or, or something have else. a mix. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, course, I, yeah, I don't yeah. want to. I want to make it binary to make it easy yeah. for our in, uh, for oh. us engineers, well. but. Um, uh, so I think the combination of all of them <coughs> are important. Um, a company like ASML, we pay a lot of attention to, uh, uh, yeah, uh, cognitive diversity. You know, we have the smart people. We from coming from different technical backgrounds, mechanical engineers with, I don't know, physicists and optical engineers. They're all trying to work together to solve uh, biggest problem. But at the end, to, to go one step further to the inclusion part, you have to look at the people. Um, yeah, behind their skin, their, their culture, and see connecting, I would say, um, sounds very maybe uh, soft, but connecting the brain with the heart, with the hands, uh, how you think, how you feel, and, and also how the process you do think together. Um, ASML has been having fantastic years uh, behind us and hopefully f in front of us as well. So that has helped us a lot to uh, finding the right people to do the job. And for that, we have... Uh, let's say uh, spread our rings globally. We are recruiting people from all around the world. So in in a way, diversity is on agenda. Uh, our agenda. We we are a very diverse company. Um, gender diversity is something we have to work. And also now we are also in a moment that they say how to make it really work. So the inclusion part is becoming more and more important. Um, I think l um, beginning of last year, we started with the campaign of uh, care, collaborate and challenge to so really make us aware of these differences and uh, how to optimize it and work together. 
Um, now the question is how we can make it more inclusive for female uh, employees and the future generations to come and work for us and not to be part of that whole ecosystem. Yeah. And, and what are the challenges there? Oh, sorry, I, I wanted to, uh, something was triggered when you were talking about um, you know the, the cultural and the other types of diversity. And I remember when I was working at Shell, um, you know it, how it ended up uh, initially because I, I did this job in 2000, um, and back in the day, diversity was something that people said, "Oh, that's from America. We don't have to do that over here in the Netherlands. We're yeah. very diverse here." Um, and <laughs> but if there, what we found is that there were some types of diversity, uh, some uh, di yeah, d the different types of diversity. Some were acceptable to work on, like gender diversity, mm -hmm. and others were less acceptable to work on, like sexual orientation at the time, and, mm -hmm. and probably still. And that was sort of like, it was funny. We had, at the time, diversity consultants in the company who, and some were just like, but, you know, this goes against my religion, so I don't, I don't, I'm not going to work this. And people were like, wait a second, you can't do some... Um, dimensions of diversity and not others yeah. and it was interesting because yeah. at the time I had started this um, the gay network in Shell um, and the women's network and I uh, we were able to get money easily from management to do women's issues but the, the GBLT um, uh, GBLT uh, and a few other uh, yeah. were uh, letters um, uh, that was much more difficult. We wanted to get the visibility for our gay employees, and I remember trying to get this, uh, to get uh, money to go and be in the gay parade um, here in Amsterdam, because the visibility aspect of you know gay employees is 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 difficult. You know the whole idea, and we couldn't get the money initially. We asked for four years in management, and finally we decided, you know what, we're going to put our own boat. In the, in the parade, because management said, ooh, what would everybody say? And we were the first gay boat, uh, the, the first corporate boat in the gay parade, and that started an entire wave of corporates all around that said, oh, well, Shell did it, so, and then all of the other corporates did it. And, and I think that was the proudest moment I ever had in my career, was being on the boat, dancing, um, and, and, but it was because it was that particular type of, of uh, diversity was not accepted. Mm. Um, and I still think there are some others that are less acceptable, and the gender one is now very much in fashion, but there still are others that I think we need to also always consider as but well. But it helps to, to set an example, right? For example, what the TUE is doing, uh, it, it could inspire others to also stick their neck out. Exactly. You know? And that was, nobody wanted to be the first. And then, and mm -hmm. then you see what happens with when you're brave enough to finally stick your neck out and yeah. people, then you become inspirational. But at first people are slamming you down and then all of a sudden, oh, look, say Eindhoven is doing it. Maybe, um, maybe we can maybe do the we same. Can try. <laughs> yeah. Uh, someone is also asking about this. Is there also something that looks like the Irene Curie Fellowship Program in other universities around the world? Yeah, there is. Uh, there are two uh, programs, uh, one in Groningen and one in Delft, where they have a, a relatively small set of vacancies for full professorships that they, um, where they only allow females uh, to apply. I think in, in Delft there was about 10 of these uh, positions and Groningen has something similar to it. I don't know the exact numbers of today, but that, and essentially those two programs uh, were also a sort of inspiration of the Irene Grey Fellowship uh, program, ah, okay. because we felt it was also, you could also justify uh, that you were taking an initiative uh, like this. Um, yeah, where it's a bit exceptional, what we've done is put all vacancies in the program. Uh, yeah. So that's what also created, I think, the, uh, the controversy, if you like. Mm. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think, it, yeah, I showed you the results. It, it really made a difference. Um, but yes, there are similar looking uh, programs uh, in the Netherlands. I even think uh, Twente also has a similar sort of thing. But it inspires each other, so maybe next yeah, yeah. year they come with a yeah, new yeah, program sure. and yeah. you know, it, it works. Yeah. Uh, Arnoud, we were just talking about how to make it work, right? And But what are the challenges you're facing there and how do you deal with that within a company? Yeah, I think my, my view is uh, that I think the challenge is, is, is still actually that that it that it needs to be discussed, you know. That's that's the challenge, um, and um, and I hope that there is a time, uh, and I hope sooner. I'm patient person, an impatient person. That that uh, that certain discussions are are natural, you know. That's the point. So the challenge is, first of all, uh, to um, yeah, to get you know over a certain I would call it hurdle. Although I like don't I don't like the word hurdle. I don't also like I don't always like uh, too much of examples. 
I accept them that we need them, but actually it, it, it should be a, an, an avalanche of, of examples, actually. That's what you're hoping for. And, and that's, I think, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's, that at the moment is, uh, is, is certainly a challenge. I think I think uh, in, in, in organizations, I've, I've lived uh, half of my year, uh, of my year of my life uh, abroad. So I'm not, you know, not maybe I'm Dutch. Yes, I've born, you know, in a small village, but I've seen a little things. But I think the challenge is 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 really to understand that it is uh, it's cooler to go out of that comfort zone and to work in this in this diverse world and and and, and the diversity doesn't matter because uh, if it's uh, sexual orientation uh, gender nationality cultural whatever and that is that's i think uh, the the challenge is to to get out of out of that small comfort zone and uh, and and that is something that uh, that we need to tackle first the rest in my opinion will then come but how hard is it for companies to to take the first step hard hard and i think i think that's why even if i don't always i think you have to, you have to reward also even if it's old-fashioned then reward is not you know it can be a lot of rewards right but uh, um, in leadership in 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 objective measuring it should play an important role and 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 uh, um, and and one day it will get out again. You know, it's a good thing. But today, I think that's 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 something that that will work to to speed it up. Yeah. I think. Um, no. Go ahead. Uh, just add something else. I think one of the challenges also is the time today. Eh? And uh, economy goes good. Most of the companies, if you look at the brain pool region, we are doing well. You mm -hmm. know, uh, even ASML is doing great. Yeah. So to make us realize what we are actually missing by not doing it, mm -hmm. that's a big challenge. You know, it's the same as uh, the first iPhone came. Nobody would have asked for an iPhone when BlackBerry was there. Till the iPhone comes and nobody wants to use a, a phone with a, 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 uh, with a keyboard and everybody wants to go touch that. So it's, it's the same idea. It's, it's about looking at, okay, what we are missing? We are doing great. What, what's wrong with it? Yeah. So that, that's, that's you, vision. How do you make that visible? Phew, it's not. I think it, it, it's not. Re the, the, sometimes by forcing or with positive actions, you really realize us and force us to look at. Oh, we actually could do better. There are opportunities. We we could go out of our comfort zone. I think these are really important uh, milestones. Either we create it for ourselves, or somebody creates it, and then we look at at uh, them and say, oh, why we shouldn't do that. So I think those are important ones. Sometimes the quotas helps, and and, and uh, yeah. So so th there is no one right answer. I think. And that's I, I think I think if you want to sort of find out what you're missing, you, it's helpful to look at sometimes your people survey. Um, lots of companies give an annual survey to see how people are feeling when they come to work, and this is you know across the board, men, women, um, and others, uh, and and essentially people who want to say I'm not feeling like I can bring my full self to work. There's usually a set of diversity questions mm -hmm. where you can start to understand like mm -hmm. hey wait a second we don't talk about diversity in our meetings we don't have um, or the way for example meetings are conducted um, I'm not feeling like I can say something or in fact I do say something but nobody listens to me but someone else says the same thing who's a man and, and all of a sudden great. everyone thinks that's a great idea yeah. and you think I think I just said that you know um, so what's going on and having that discussion about you know um, not just looking about getting work done but also how work right. is done and how it feels to yeah. do the work, um, you know, and who gets noticed in meetings and, you know, who gets um, uh, praised, that sort of stuff. What's public? Being aware of all of our interactions and how we do business is just as important as the lagging indicator of, okay, people aren't people who are different are not leaving the organization, they're staying because they feel like this is a good place for them. It's interesting, you said it indeed in before, you want to stay at a company and you see this for example at, at the younger generations as well, uh, they want to have a purpose, you know, they're, they're searching for a company that, that has a, c a clear vision, it's not about making money or, uh, anymore, it's about contributing to a better world and, and diversity is part of it. I, th I think that's changing, right? What do you think? I, yeah, for sure. I think um, now being able to uh, to make that contribution and that whole feeling element, um, you know, employers have started to recognize that that's how they need to also bring younger people in and, and start. But are they then doing the right things to then 
engage with them, don't just give them positions and coaching, but actually the, you know, um, the people skills that are that are accompanying keeping people who are young and ambitious. You know, um, do we have that, and are we working on that as well as actually giving out you know ambitious roles to young people? But so I would not also include we talking about age uh, diversity. It's not only about young people. No. I mean, people well, who have course, corporate yeah. life might go to work for a start. I mean, we see people are moving constantly. It's not. Um, uh, I mean, when I worked in Japan, it was very um, a standard to live your life in a company, and that was how you would do it. And but it's changing even in those cultures. So yeah. I think there is always this competition, uh, and, and people are all constantly looking at what I'm going to do, wh 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 why I'm here, wh wh how I'm going to spend my all my days. So, and, and also I, I think one of the aspects of um, COVID and being at home and the, the barrier between work and life is becoming vaguer. So mm. you, you, you kind of um, working constantly while mm. you're also at home constantly kind of, you're trying to, uh, more and more people think about what, what is more important for me and why I'm doing a work. So in that sense, uh, I think any generation is thinking about yeah. the purpose in their work. Yeah. And, and I think then the diversity being heard, uh, being included in your work, I think it plays a more important role. And your difference being yes. valued. Yes. Instead of like, oh, we have to work with that. No, and that difference is actually what can you know lift yeah. the rest of people yeah, around. Yeah, but that's exactly then. That I think the, what I was trying to describe the biggest challenge yeah, because you have to identify these differences that are making at the end you know the some bigger than the the, the, the individual parts. Right. Yeah. And to find yeah these difference and also give them a place. That's uh, that's yeah that's and I think also for certain people still a struggle. Yeah, and uh, that that. Um, um, that's why I say I, I think that, that I like the word cool in that sense because, yeah, uh, I agree, Helen. I think not not only young people are are working more today for for the purpose, and uh, and I wouldn't consider myself young, but also I think it's, it's becoming becoming more and more an important thing in my life. So it's not it's not it's maybe. It's more the time that we live in, mm -hmm. and not so much your age, because that I don't like that discrimination at all. I have fantastic colleagues at the at the age of 64 that are, you know, uh, you know, fit like like a youngster and and want to still to learn. So I think I think um, the the struggle is that not everybody sees this this advantage, yeah? and and that's something, yeah, where, where it needs more push now then it probably will need in 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 in, in, uh, in, uh, in 10 years and you see also that example the word example was used in frank's case like, like like this should be an example for well it will be an example or uh, different initiatives of the same kind uh, and and i i believe that one day uh, not so far hopefully it, it becomes something natural yeah do you think, Helen, um, companies become are becoming more open for diversity? Uh, uh, yeah, definitely we are open. As I said, uh, uh, talent scarcity pushes us to be more open to hire people. It's amazing if if I meet. Uh, sometimes we have these uh, coffee times virtual now virtual coffee times with our uh, board of management, and the type the, the fun thing is actually go and see who's joining these coffee times because they have colleagues who come from aerospace, they come from um, uh, banking, they come from uh, mining world. So it's really really diverse. So they're looking for people now. Um, looking at specifically uh, female talent, I think is, is still a challenge. So um, there is, there is uh, for, for me, there is short term and long term. Eh? So short term, we are looking at okay, hiring more uh, junior engineers, uh, fresh graduates from the schools. How to get more s girls to do scientific or tech related uh, studies and then hire them um, is important. But then, then the next step is how to have these. Um, young girls and women uh, go to the le next steps and become the next leaders. And I think there there is a still a gap because there's a very nice book also, No Ceilings, uh, No no Glasses. It's a book about um, also in stereotyping how we see leadership and women, the role of women in that. Um, and 
especially in the tech world, we have too little of them, is that women are uh, considered very um, strong in uh, soft skills, connecting, communication, and things like that. And I think in the normal engineering jobs, it's really fantastic to have more of women because they really actually listen and and, and trying to connect people who are, uh, and, and this is, uh, they don't have to have a tech background either. You just need to connect these scientific, uh, scienti uh, scientists and sci uh, um, um, engineers. But um, when we go into leadership, we also have to make sure we give them, and that comes this positive action again back, opportunities to show that they are also good in leadership, good in management, good in um, running a business. Yeah, which role calls, models. Yeah, which is more about how to yeah, make the targets meet, sell the tools, or, or uh, achieve publications, get funding inside. So there is there's two aspects that we have to, I think, have different action plans uh, for them. You know, how to have more young people and how to, for example, have, in case of university, more professorships uh, seats uh, filled by women. Or in, in companies, how to have more senior management um, seats filled by women. Uh, Frank, if, if you look at, at the lessons you learned uh, during the Iron Curie Fellowship Program so far, mm -hmm. uh, what could be useful for, uh, for companies out of this? Well, <coughs> um uh, uh, it, uh, setting clear targets uh, definitely helps because it makes everyone aware of the situation. What really has helped us in this whole process is to discuss these issues openly and to have people coming in. Uh, so we were very fortunate that we've met the Professor Naomi Elmas. Naomi Elmas is, is a, by all standards, an outstanding scientist. Uh, she, she won very prestigious uh, rewards and she's a university professor in uh, Utrecht. That really helps in the scientific community because it's someone of scientific standing. And so she visited us, our university, a couple of times, uh, had meetings uh, with, uh, with, with the board, with meetings with the deans, and then also a couple of departments. And so gradually, everyone started to understand how we are being affected in this particular case by implicit gender bias and what we could do about it. So there was a sort of a generic understanding. And in particular, I can give you one example. There was one department that stood out, uh, applied physics. They invited Naomi Elmas in the department, and again, she presented the story, was faced with all the questions, all the prejudices that we had, and she was able to convince uh, the And then they really took positive action, and they really stood out. Um, and that was because they were convinced by, by this, this story. Th this is perhaps the thing that you could do in a company, make sure that people are convinced of the added value of having this diversity. What does it bring the company? Does the company indeed improve? Do the teams perform better? Uh, can we have more creative solutions? Uh, and so forth. Once you are convinced that that's the case, then everything else is relatively easy. Yeah. <laughs> but it takes that you, that you really have to understand why you have to make that change. And it takes time. Uh, also, in our case, it had taken a, a couple of years uh, before we really appreciated uh, the importance of it. Um, but then it becomes, I think, a lot easier. Yeah. That takes a bit of time, takes a bit of planning and, and explanation, and it, depending a bit on the company, where, what kind of people have to present that story. In our case, it was a scientist because we're a scientific community, but maybe it has to be something else in the company. I don't know. It's something that you need to figure out. Arnold, but what do you think yeah. of all of this? I, 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 I hear some things that uh, I fully subscribe, uh, like, like the targets and also an, an example. Um, so, um, um, yes, I... Um, I'm just thinking of of still of of how to you know uh, how to really get it get it mm -hmm. uh, get it done and I think also we have to accept maybe of organizations companies that sometimes you have to face some criticism maybe uh, by and also think your example is 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 demonstrating that criticism in a positive sense but. Um, uh, because it I, I call it this push and 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 in order to get there. Uh, and to, to, to make it discussable, to communicate, to, to listen to your people, but also to, to, to be brave and, and, and take a decision um, that's saying, I want this, okay? And, and that helps. Even if I still believe that one day we don't have to push it that hard, um, I would prefer to be a successful organization. By the way, you can never say that you weren't successful if you wouldn't have done it. So that's always mm -hmm. a, the difficult thing in life, but still, you know, success is on your side if you do it. And that's 
part of criticism actually always was the case in, in, in good things. Eh? And, and let's not go in examples, but many great things were criticized by people and were very successful. And so... Um, so sometimes you just have to stick your neck out. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And otherwise, because otherwise uh, um, um, things might or might not fall in the right place. So, and, and, and uh, yeah, you know, might not fall. That's not a chance you want to take. So stick out your neck and, and yeah, the criticism, fine. You know, this is always in good decisions the case. So don't bother. But, um, and, and, and yeah, you hear me also saying that, that I think maybe overdoing it a little bit, but target-driven is, is sometimes helpful in this case. Uh, um, <coughs> and and that, that, uh, that part of criticism people recognize when you, when you look at your targets, yeah, it, sometimes it takes ways to get there. So be brave. Yeah, what, what also I think might, have, might, might, might help if you have uh, people in uh, certain leadership uh, positions that have experienced themselves what the added value of diversity is. Um, I've had my own experience in that, in that sense, because I, was, I graduated in mechanical engineering, uh, which was male dominant. I, I think there were only two or three female students in, in my year, if you like. <coughs> I worked at Philip Research. Um, the, the group was completely male. And I went back to university, initially within mechanical engineering. I think 99% was male. That was the male setting. That was my point of reference. Then I transferred, because of the interest I had in the, in, the, in the discipline, to biomedical engineering. And there it's uh, far more balanced, I think. Actually, I think today, it's, um, in, in particular on the if it's PhD students, we have more females than we have males. So that's where I experienced the added value. It was a, a very different community, really significantly different. Still very much driven by what we would like to achieve, and, uh, and so very scientifically oriented, but it was a different way of handling it. So there was enormous added value that I saw, and I experienced it. And, and, and that, yeah, this experience, I think, has helped me in, 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 in building and taking these kinds of decisions. So having people at certain position, a leadership position, that, that really have had been through something like this, a similar experience, I think will help in, in, in meeting the target, if you, if you would like to formulate it in the target. But it's really something that has to, something that you really have to feel that you should do it. Mm. Yeah. It has to be a purpose. Uh, that, that, like I said, like we said it before, you see a lot of people, in particular I see it also with, with our students, they are far more purpose-driven than ever before. Yeah. And, and that is really motivational. And people are go for something. I think going for uh, inclusivity and going for diversity is also something that you have to feel one way or the other. You have to be convinced that that's the, the, the way forward. Uh, rather than someone telling you that you should do it. <laughs> yeah. I think having targets also for in the inclusiveness side of the picture, yeah. which is when you're, for example, having a lunch and learn, saying, okay, every business is going to have one lunch and learn about a topic like um, sexual orientation, mm -hmm. um, you know, and then this goes through the company and, and people will go to these things, they'll learn, it's going to be fun, but that's when they start to get maybe um, an experience of like, hey, this is interesting. I hadn't realized that somebody thought this in the company, so, and because I, I don't think like that. And hearing that in these inclusiveness sort of fun settings of learning and understanding about what a particular difference is and what are the struggles that that difference yeah. is having in your company kind of brings this, this new way of thinking. It's not, it's, it's so it becomes more real. Like, hey, this was my friend, but I never knew that, this, that she was struggling with, with these issues, because I don't struggle with these issues. Yeah. So um, the inclusiveness target, may I suggest, um, might be something uh, to add as well, doing different you know, learning sessions, as well as just looking at the numbers of X group. Yeah. No, absolutely. And also dare, I dare to make mistakes, huh? Yeah. Dare to make mistakes. Yeah. You make the, I've made my mistakes. Everybody I'm, I'm not mistakes. a perfect example by any standards. And so I, I, like I said, I come from a completely male-dominant uh, uh, environment. So I've made my mistakes. But it's also important that someone tells you every now and then, now you make a mistake. And then you start thinking about it. And having uh, that kind of a learning of environment where people are open. And Leaders are it. saying, tell me, what am yeah. I doing? Yeah, but and I still make these mistakes. Of course. Every now and then I, 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 I go back and I, for instance, I've, I've, I've composed a committee. Out of like, my goodness, I forgot about. <laughs> so you, and I'm aware of it, but still you make these mistakes. And so every now and then, someone has to tell tell you now you made this mistake. Think about it, and then you 
gradually improve. So this is actually as a teamwork, a collective, well. yeah, a collective teamwork. I mean, the, and management to leaders, yeah, yeah. We need people to who work to in out. the teams. Yeah, yeah. They, everybody has to take their role and be part of yeah. it. Yeah. If I if I treat you inappropriately, someone has to tell me you, what you did was inappropriate. But if you're in a position of power. That's very difficult, yeah. you know, for me to, to yeah. walk over to you. And yeah. so I have yeah. to feel like no matter what, I'm going to yeah. be safe sure. if I'm going to make sure. that True. intervention. But True. I wonder how often something like that yeah, actually that, that happens. It does happen, and we do intervene. But, uh, but I think it's also important that colleagues sort of help each other. We, we used to have a tool in Shell that okay. we would track what goes on in meetings, and we would uh, sort of appoint an observer. And that person was basically you know, keeping track of like, who does the talking, who does the positive, um, you know, like, an, uh, positive um, praise for somebody, and what does the, how often does the leader actually acknowledge somebody else. So there was like a, kind of like a checklist, and people would go through, the, and at the end, the observer would say, I noticed that you know, 60% of the time this person was speaking, and 20% of the time this person was speaking, and this person came up with an idea, but it wasn't recognized until that person said it. And all of a sudden, you're getting statistics about mm -hmm. how you That's were confronting. in a meeting. Yeah. Very confronting, and it has to be, but it's a real learning mechanism so that people like, oh, I hadn't thought about that. And it's a beautiful sort of tool to sort of, if you're open, for leaders to sort of say, I'm willing to learn about yeah. my own leadership mm -hmm. by having somebody do this, but it, you have to make it safe for that person. But I think that's a that's a brilliant way to do yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, definitely. I think that's a nice uh, conclusion to this discussion. <laughs> I think we can talk for hours about this, right? <laughs> we can, yeah. But but unfortunately, that's um, maybe a little bit too long for the viewers <laughs> at home. Uh, I would like to thank you all, Helen Kandan. Thank you so much, Arno de Jong. Thank you, Mindy Howard. Thank you, and Frank Bryant. Thank you for joining uh, us yeah. and uh, for your inspiration. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, and at this part of the stage, we will focus more on equality right now. And by the way, it's good to see in Lou all the interaction in the YouTube chat. Yeah, definitely. And we are so looking forward to have it live here in the audience oh, again next time. Definitely. Um, Evita, may in I invite you on stage? Um, Evita Stoop, our next speaker will tell a great story about equality and new leadership. She is the Chief Marketing Officer Benelux at IBM. And the floor is yours, uh, Evita. Thank you. Um, yeah. Excellent. Thanks. So thank you for inviting me to these um, session to the Female Tech Heroes Conference of this year. Very happy to be here, having seen very much inspirational speeches and things that inspire me, and hopefully you as well. So in this coming half hour, I'll be talking about equality, equity, and new leadership. And I hope after the 25 minutes that I'll be speaking, you'll walk away with the sense that Equality is very important to make sure that people have equal opportunities and equal benefits on the work floor. Next to that, equity is extremely important, making sure that you offer specific benefits, specific assistance and support to different people in your organization. But ultimately, as was also referred to in the panel, it's what makes it unique to specific individuals or what are the benefits that are really relevant for a business. That is what is extremely important, and it requires new leadership really to make that change and transition. So before we go into that, let's start off with looking at a little bit of current data. And that data comes from um, a bit of research that was executed between November 2020 uh, and January this year. Amongst 2,700 men and women from all kinds of different industries, 10 different industries, nine different geographies um, all over the world, basically. Senior managers, middle managers, and professionals. And after that session, there were 3,100 people that were joined together in a two-day virtual workshop to talk about the topics that both came up in the research and also what was coming out of their experience and the way how they look and had a perspective on um, basically the, the, the sense of gender e equity on the work floor. And what was very stunning is that not only had the amount of people on executive positions 
8% of women uh, were, were placed on executive positions, 10% women in the C-suite. That has remained completely equal over the past two years, so between 2019 and 2021, the percentage was completely stalled. But beyond that, something that is even more appalling is that the pipeline seems to dry up a little bit. And that is a dangerous thing. Because, of course, if there aren't the right women available in the pipeline to fill those executive positions, we're really in trouble. So here you see that overview. Basically, on the right side, you see that 8%, 10% of people on those executive boards. And before that, you see that pipeline drying out. So in those two years, literally all of those positions that lead up to those executive positions, they're reducing in number. And then you might ask, so what is going on? What is happening that actually during those last two years, and they've been predominantly defined also by our COVID times, what has happened that these pipelines are drying out? What's going on? And one of the specific verbatims that comes up in that research is the following one. I will read it out. Employees feel gender equity fatigue over ineffective programmatic efforts to address the problem. So people are basically getting tired of programs that don't work to really drive that gender equity. So what's going on? What exactly um, do we mean with those programs? Let's have a look at that. So when we look at equality, um, it's about driving those equal benefits to different people in your organization, like the box has same types of boxes for different people. And I think we've gone a step beyond that, realizing that you actually want to achieve equity. So you want to look at the differences also between the people in your organization and say, well, actually one person needs something else than another person. So one person needs maybe no box at all, another person needs several boxes, basically, um, to be at their best in their organization. But what is in those boxes? So if we talk about those programs that are seen as ineffective, what exactly are those programs? So what's in that box? I think we can all see a couple of them. We had a couple of nice examples also today um, of programs that drive more women into the work floor. Um, we have expanding access to childcare. We have gender blind job candidate screening or putting females on top of the stack, as we've heard. Parental leave for women, education or reskilling opportunities training women to speak up, to learn to say no. I love that one. I'll get back to that one later on as well. All these programmatic efforts are deemed ineffective. That's what came out of the research. And now I'm going to go beyond basically what that research talked about, because basically in the research, they look at all kinds of ways how to make those programs more effective, how you can instill all kinds of actions. But I would like to have a look at, is that really what we need to focus on. Should we focus on the programs? Is that the key issue that's going on? Because basically we're in very specific times, COVID times. And what do we do when we're in uncertainty? We try to seek comfort. We try to go back to things that are familiar to us. And Freud also calls it the repetition compulsion. It's people trying to reach back to things that they're familiar with and anything that's out of the ordinary, so anything that doesn't help directly reach your goal, specifically when you're in panic. In COVID, lots of people in panic, my business is dying out. Anything that's additional, you want to put aside. If it doesn't directly help your business from going background, if there's a program to help those poor women also be there in the work floor, that's almost what we're getting at. Eh? if you're not careful. Those programs, if they feel like additional effort, if they don't contribute to the essence, they can be dismissed. I want to go to an example to illustrate this point driven out of my own experience. And I'm using the reference to being one red tulip in a field of yellow tulips. So I've had this experience in my, in my job a couple of years back, and I was the one and only woman in an executive board. And I was in that meeting, uh, one of the first management team meetings, and I observed a little bit how things were going. And after a few of those meetings with all the men in the room, there was an idea that I really wanted to discuss with the group. So I got up and I mentioned the new idea that I had, and I invited all the people in the room 
to join in on the conversation, to use their experience, to use their point of view and their perspective on that new topic that I wanted to introduce. What happened? Half of the audience felt silent. They completely shut up. And the other half of the guys, they said, ah, oh, you cannot do that. It's impossible. We've tried it, been there, done that, got the t-shirt. It's not going to work. And basically, this discussion was going on a little bit um, for a while. And then the manager of that team, basically, he jumped in and he said, OK, let's stop this discussion. The meeting went on. And after the meeting, my manager came up to me and he said, well, Evita, you got to realize that's not how things are done over here. We're a funny bunch, and you'll learn to how, how, how these things are being done, and you have to talk to each and every one individually, and they'll own have their own funny ideas. But we're very happy to have you on board. Welcome. See you later. <laughs> so how do you think that felt? How do you think I basically stood up a next meeting to again address something that I thought should be changed or a new idea that I was having? I was basically that red tulip, that woman in the field that was tolerated. Yes, they were very happy to have a woman there in the executive board. But I wasn't accepted for what I was bringing in. And I was actually re going to another woman at a certain moment in that organization. I said, did you ever experience gender bias in our organization? And she said, no, no, no. I, I never experienced anything like that. And I told her about my experience, and I said, well, actually, this is what happened to me. And when I explained that, she said, well, uh, something like that happened to me all the time, basically. It, it, it goes on again and again. And she didn't realize, basically, she forgot, in a way, what it was like to be a red tulip. Slowly over time, and I didn't know, I don't know if you saw it happen, but that red tulip just turned into a yellow tulip. You blend in. If you're not appreciated for that specific new color that you're bringing in, it's very easy to slowly deviate towards the common norm in that group, to become one of the yellow tulips. Because that is basically what reconfirms you. That's the norm that you need to follow. And it's easy to go there. And to illustrate that, I would like to go to a little movie that also explains this in a very nice way. It's a minute and a half, so um, enjoy. If you've learned a lot about leadership and making a movement, then let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under three minutes and dissect some lessons. First, of course, a leader needs the guts to stand alone and look ridiculous. But what he's doing is so simple, it's almost instructional. This is key. You must be easy to follow. Now here comes the first follower with a crucial role. He publicly shows everyone else how to follow. Notice how the leader embraces him as an equal. So it's not about the leader anymore, it's about them, plural. Notice how he's calling to his friends to join in. So it takes guts to be a first follower. You stand out and you brave ridicule yourself. Being a first follower is an underappreciated form of leadership. The first follower transforms a lone nut into a leader. If the leader is the flint, the first follower is the spark that really makes the fire. Now here's the second follower. This is a turning point. It's proof the first has done well. Now it's not a lone nut, and it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd, and a crowd is news. A movement must be public. Make sure outsiders see more than just the leader. Everyone needs to see the followers, because new followers emulate followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people, then three more immediately. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point, and now we have a movement. As more people jump in, it's no longer risky. If they were on the fence before, there's no reason not to join in now. They won't stand out, they won't be ridiculed, and they will be part of the in crowd if they hurry. And over the next minute you'll see the rest who prefer to stay part of the crowd, because eventually they'd be ridiculed for not joining. And ladies and gentlemen, that is um, how a movement is made. So I think it's, it's quite an easy jump how to go from this to what I was talking about on the red tulip in the yellow tulip field. As long as you're that one red tulip that is seen as a lone nut, basically an idiot, and everybody looks at you, why are you being so weird? And why are you doing things so differently? And people don't really respect why you're there. They're not gonna 
follow you. There's not going to be your first follower because everybody feels like they're being ridiculed when they get up on that stage. But once people realize what is that value that you're bringing in, and they're really trying to celebrate that rather than to just tolerate it, you slowly breed a field where you have more and more of those red tulips. And it's a lot like the lone nut movie that you're trying to get everybody to be turned into red tulips. So it's, it's not the idea that you want to change the field from completely yellow to completely red, but you want to strike a balance. You want to have the good what the yellow brings in, you want to have the good what the red brings in, and ultimately diversity, obviously you have loads of other types of colors. So if we compare that to the programmatic efforts and the boxes that I was talking about, Really, the change in thinking should be that we don't look specifically only at different pro programs and introducing those programs, but, but we really understand what is that specific thing that people bring in, that the unique differences are that if you want to have more women on the work floor, it's not about women in general. It's about specific individuals that bring in something unique. So yes, you can continue bringing in different elements and even reduce the fence, but what is much more interesting, and I've photoshopped that myself, as you can see, done in a very childish way, but I've put that little boy in the field because maybe it's not a sad little boy that needs all those boxes. And then you always look at, okay, he's a little bit less than all the others because he needs all those boxes. But maybe that little boy is much better being in the field, understanding what is the ultimate game that you're playing and what is the thing that we really need. And then maybe something that looks like a disadvantage, that this boy needs all these extra support and tools and assistance. All of a sudden you change your mindset to say, how can we leverage based on what we need in the organization for growth? Because that ultimately, and it's been said before, diversity means growth, but it's not a generalistic thing. It's about specific skills and specific leadership styles that we need now more than ever. And then my second element of this, of this presentation, I'll talk exactly about that. So what is that new leadership that we're looking for? And what is that specific reason why we need to look differently and how we drive our business? And in this area, I'll be talking about three key leadership styles, and I'll call them feminine leadership styles, because I think specifically feminine behavior, and explicitly I'm not saying women here, and I'll get back to that, feminine leadership is inclusive, is open to change, it's collaborative, working together, it has a very human face, working together with people at the center, which is more important than ever. Let's just have a look at those three examples of the new types of skills in leadership that we need. So this is actually a picture from over 100 years ago, 1918, when Henry Ford was building his mass production line for the T model. And at that time, leadership was completely different from today. When you're in a mass production line and your business is very repetitive, you need leadership that basically repeats what has been done before. So if you're very good at your job, if you're doing your job in the right way, you know all the nuts and bolts, at a certain moment you become a manager and you tell the people in your team how to do their job, how to do their nuts and bolts and how they do it as good as you've ever done it at a certain stage. And after a couple of years, you become a manager of managers. And all of them know better than the people on the floor how to do things, which is great, this homogeneous way of doing things. When you're in a business, that is extremely predictable. Five years from now, 10 years from now, you know exactly what you need to do. You can have the directive, driven style of saying, I'm a manager, I know what I need to do, I know what you need to do, just do it. But that's not where we are today. Today, we're in maybe industrial revolution number four, where things are changing at rapid speed, where we need resilience, where we need people that embrace that change, people that don't just take the norm the way we did things last year. We've done that, we've got the T-shirt, we cannot do it. They don't take no for an answer. They're willing to just give it another try. Experience in a certain field isn't the lead element that tells you whether you're the right person to lead a team. If you've never been a leader, if you've never been in sales, it might not even matter because maybe that line of expertise doesn't necessarily need what it used to need five years ago because we specifically need people that embrace that change 
rather than to be extremely dominant and directive in what needs to happen. The second leadership style that I would like to refer to is around collaboration. Collaboration is extremely important and more than ever again. With the complex questions that we have in our hands, and, and we've seen also the speed at which those questions come up, but also the complexity. There's not one individual. There's even not one company. It needs an ecosystem of companies, individuals, universities, developers, startups, experienced people, to all join forces to look at those complex issues and say, okay, together we can try to make sense of what the issue is and try to make a change into how we deal with it. And therefore you need people that don't feel that knowledge is the way forward, but actually being open, having an open mindset, a growth mindset, and having an always learning focus on doing things that want to collaborate, that don't feel that they need to speak up, they need to be the first in the room to say, hey, I know what the answer is, but they can listen, they can take a step back, and they can invite others to bring in their opinion. That type of leadership, feminine leadership, that is something that requires this new change in this world of today, it's required. The third one that I want to point out is around the area of artificial intelligence and the need to look at the ethics side of things. So artificial intelligence is moving up in any business that you look at. Any business in the world is becoming a digital organization, basically. And artificial intelligence is leveraging all the data to basically be create predictive models for all kinds of decisions that are being made, whether it's for your supply chain or what have you. And to give a very simple example on, on, on how that works, because artificial intelligence, it's not a magic box. It's not where you just throw in a question and then there's some super brain that gives you the answer. What it does, it uses data from the past to give you answer. It, it finds patterns on how things are being done and then it provides you an answer. So let's look at a simple example of a translation service. So, um, a translation bot, basically, is a, a, a simple form. If you translate the English sentence of he is a nurse and she is a doctor into Turkish, I've been told that he and she basically uses the same word, so it becomes something like it is a nurse and it is a doctor. If you then translate it back via that same trans translation bot, it will give you back she is a nurse and he is a doctor. Because all that data from the past that this artificial intelligence is based on will tell you that usually, usually, she is a nurse and he is a doctor. And that bias is in that data. And before we know it, if we don't deal with artificial intelligence in a smart way, in a human way, if we continuously look at the way how we built those databases and built those new artificial intelligence, we end up making all kinds of decisions or being informed in our decisions, because basically we're working too much augmented intelligence in politics, in supply chain, in energy supply into different regions, based on old data and old bias. And of course, we cannot let that happen. So those leadership styles around embracing change, around collaboration, around doing things with a very close look on the ethical side of things, the people side of things, that's extremely important. Those, and I call them feminine leadership styles because there are a lot of women that possess those skills. And they're immediately also because I hope actually some of you have gone a little bit like, she keeps talking about feminine skills. There's enough men that have this as well. And I just want to really make this point. Feminine is not the same as women. And, and it came up a little bit in the panel just now. I actually don't even believe that the biological side of men and women is so binary because you have intersex, you have transgender. There's a whole variety of what biologically you can be let alone as characteristics. People can have all kinds of characteristics. Men can have very feminine types of traits. Um, even certain, certain cultures, if you look at the Western society, tends to be a little bit more masculine, It'll be a little bit more that they want to stand up and speak uh, before listening, which is more maybe a little bit more the Eastern culture. So when I talk about 
feminine. Uh, I know it's a generalistic statement, but I hope it triggers that there's a lot of feminine, a lot of women that also possess those traits, and that is what is very important. So what is the essence of all of this that I've been talking about? It's not about being that sole red tulip in the field, just for the fact of putting a woman in place, because she can continue that activity quite a while. You can put different women there, but before you know it, they will turn into yellow tulips if you don't specifically appreciate them and celebrate them for the unique things they bring in. If there's a specific woman that brings in those collaboration skills, that's why you hire that individual in that field. If there's somebody specifically bringing in that very human way, being a data analyst, but also having this eye for, for ethical behavior, ethics in that data, that's why you're bringing that woman. And then during COVID times, it's not that there's all kinds of programs that are exhausting and the gender equity is at stake because you want to get rid of all those programs. You don't want to get rid of people that really drive your business. So we shouldn't think of putting women on the work floor as a magical formula. We just bring in women there, something happens, Ta -ta -da -da. and then you look back and you go, you've reached your target and we create success and we've got more money. Yay! It needs to be the other way, where you look at what do we need as a business, what makes us su successful, what are the types of skills that we need, and we need to be smart in doing that. This is not an HR thing. We got to get rid of the whole idea that this diversity thing is an HR, it's a people-oriented initiative. It's a business imperative to drive growth. As a business, managers, they need to make sure that they really understand what do I need. So if I'm gonna hire a new person, don't look if you need a man or a woman, look at what are specific skills that you need on board to make your company successful with an open mind. Not going like, okay, I need a manager position, so I need somebody with 10 years of management experience. No, maybe you don't. Maybe something else is much more important. Actually, just three weeks back, I was part of the hiring board of a new hire of an innovation studio that we're setting up within uh, IBM in Amsterdam. And um, th there were a couple of different candidates for the lead role, men, women. And ultimately, it was a discussion, so who are we going to hire? And, and somebody said, well, this woman, she's a woman, and she's got this management experience. Why don't we take her? I said, well, yeah, she may be a woman, but actually the way how she manages, it's pretty directive, and it's not extremely maybe inclusive and, and driving for that collaboration, what we really need in that innovation studio. And there was another woman, maybe by coincidence also women, there were also lots of men applying to the job, and she had never managed a team before. But she's a yoga teacher, she brings groups together, she has all kinds of other little clubs where she creates a lot of collab collaboration in her job, outside of her job. She has leadership skills, she has the skills that are required in that team to make it happen. And I was able, together with the rest of the team, by taking this approach, to hire her. So as a leader, as a person hiring um, new talent, that's one thing you need to do. As talent, you also have a responsibility. Because don't just say, I'm a woman, or I have a certain specific different type of background, so I'm different, so please hire me. But you need to make a connection between what is unique about you, and how is that uniqueness, how is that relevant specifically for this business. So if you see that business is in need of something, and you've got something to offer in that area, and maybe it's experience, so as a senior citizen, you're extremely relevant in that startup environment. Or maybe as a very young person, you're extremely relevant in that more senior environment to bring in those new ideas. And as a woman, think about what is it specifically you're bringing in. And it's not just, and it shouldn't be, that you bring in the fact that biologically you're a woman. Because that's not the thing that makes the difference. It's what you bring as an individual. And when you're evaluated for that, that's where you make the change. So with that, I hope those 25 minutes gave you that feeling of, yes, equality, important, equity, 
in giving different types of, of benefits and programs to the different people, very important, but specifically having those individual contributions of an, individual, of an individual celebrated, that's what really creates new leadership. Thank you. Thank you so much, Evita. This is really inspiring and powerful as well. Yes. Um, would you like to join me in the next panel? Absolutely. The, the second chair is yours. Yay. Yay. <laughs> and uh, oh, we're going to be joined. This. Yes, oh. of course, you can put it on the table. Thank you. Um, and we're going to be joined by two more people. So we're going to call them on the stage. They're going to walk uh, down the stairs. So they take a little while. Um, we're going to talk about equality and why it can't wait. Uh, so please uh, join us. Astrid Balsink, Global Director, Inclusion and Diversity at Philips. She's already coming. And Sheena Leenders, Vice President, EUV Factory at ASML. So give them a very big virtual applause, please. <laughs> Sheila, welcome. Thank you. You're the Vice President, EUV Factory at ASML. That's right. That's right. Welcome. <laughs> Astrid. Also joining us on stage, so Samira Rafaela, a member of the European Parliament for D66, um, was also joining us for the panel, but she couldn't be here in real life. But we did uh, receive a, a nice video of her, which we can include in the panel about uh, women's rights and equality. So uh, we're definitely going to hear from her as well. Um, so we're going to wait for Astrid to join on stage as well. Yes, welcome. Thank you. And please sit down. Um, Sheila, what do you think of the keynote by Evita? I thought it was really great. So your focus on, uh, uh, let's say, the, the, that, that people can bring their individual uniqueness to the table and that will help us to grow as a business. I think this is spot on. What do you think, Astrid? Um, very good. I think it's uh, inspiring and I'm happy uh, to be here today. Fantastic uh, setup and uh, program you have. So compliments to both. Um, I thought it was, uh, it was very good and I think the key question is not the business case of diversity anymore. I think everybody's convinced that it's, uh, it's a business imperative and how important it is. But how do you actually make diverse talent actually not come into your company but stay? And how do you make them thrive? And I think that is really the question at stake in today's world. How do you involve the whole organization by creating a culture where everybody can be and bring their best? And I think that's really the question way beyond HR. It's actually about your whole organization. Yeah. So in this panel, we will focus more on gender as part of the diversity uh, discussion. We named this conversation Equality Can't Wait by the uh, initiative by Melinda Gates. Uh, the World Economic Forum states that if we look at the US, if we don't speed up the pace of change, it will take 208 years to reach gender equality. <laughs> Astrid. Or even longer. That's a long time. <laughs> it's a very long time, but I think we have an opportunity now to intervene and to change the game. So we've tried first uh, when we started in the 90s to kind of fix the women, right? We had these women leadership programs and learning how to behave like men. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about diversity only to then bring in inclusion to say we need to all feel included. And now it's very much about belonging. And I think if COVID showed us anything, it's that we're all human and we're very connected. And that brings an opportunity for that discussion about how do you make everybody belong and also leverage the strength of our differences per your keynote. How are we actually going to do this? And if this was a simple quick fix, we would have already fixed it, right? <laughs> but COVID showed us we're all human on the good side, but it also showed us the limitations, right? Um, hybrid working brought opportunities and threats um, where you combine work and life and there is no balance anymore, but it's about finding a new rhythm that suits you. And I think to your point of an intervention, as we start to work differently, have a different balance before it was shaping your life around work sometimes, but now it's definitely shaping work around life also. And both are important. So it's that rhythm again. It brings the opportunity to intervene and say, if we're all human and have a need to belong, how can we together help each other to be better? Because being human, we have also a primitive brain and that primitive brain is very present. So even if we say, I love more diverse teams as a leader, in the beginning, it's not so much fun. It's more 
issues. It's longer meetings because we don't automatically agree. Um, it is more fuss because I don't know what to expect from you. Um, so I think um, this requires hard work and therefore I think also that the opportunity is to open up and admit also that we have limitations being human. It's the social era, the era of teams, Together, we can actually be better and address this. We will never get rid of bias, for example, because it's part of the way we are wired and our brain works. So, but we can work together to actually mitigate the space for bias, to bring it, to reduce the space for bias. But that you can only do together as a team. So what we need is courageous dialogues, ongoing dialogues and learning. As the Technical University was saying before, we all need to learn, we're not perfect. So let's not go into a time where we say, oh, we all need to kind of be cautious and politically correct to say the right thing. Let's be human, we are. We make mistakes every day, I do too. I say sometimes the wrong thing from a good intent, but please correct me if I do so. If we start doing that across the organization, I think that's where inclusion starts to exist because you're addressing it above the surface and talking and learning together and I think that is really where we're moving into. Interesting. Uh, also what, what you said about bias. Evita, do you think we can never get rid of our bias? Well, I think that the, the bias basically comes from how we as human beings also have learned to respond to certain things and it helps us as we grow up um, also to make certain decisions whether something is good or something is bad or scary or I'm going to walk towards it or away from it. So um, I think what we can do is to be uh, aware of it. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you're aware of the bias that you have and that other people might have, I think that's, that's where it starts, right? Agreed. That you are aware of it and that you kind of take a step back before you say like, oh, this person feels so natural to interact with that person. That must be the next person on my, on my, on my team. Whereas maybe that person that doesn't feel so natural, you might say like, oh, I'm gonna listen to my intuition. Um, but you need to then remember, oh, this might be my bias. This is a different person, comes across in a different way. I'm just gonna take that step back. And like, like Mindy actually said, hit pause. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think there, this feedback culture, what you're referring to is really key. Huh? So yep. I think everybody has a bias. You can be aware of it, or you are not. Quite often people are not aware, yeah. but if you then can give that feedback with a little bit of humor. Uh, at least that's my experience, it helps a lot. And then you can try to change the decision-making process that is ongoing, basically. Do you use the humor? I use that a lot because I, I just, I mean, I've been growing up in a male uh, environment for the past 25 years. And I've learned a lot of people are totally not aware of them by it, so they have the best possible intentions, but well, <laughs> the execution is not, you not know, perfect, so well. yeah. <laughs> like, like with all of us. Uh. Yeah. And if you just address that in a non-aggressive way, I think that's really important with a bit of humor, then people realize what is happening and they are willing to rethink the way they do stuff. You, you are the, the vice president of the EUV factory at ASML, uh, which is a very uh, male-dominated work environment. Yep. How do you bring change in, in a, a male-dominated environment? Uh, for me, it's not so unique, eh, because I've been leading high-tech factories for the past 20 years. Eh, so for me, it's actually very common <laughs> to be in a you know, 96%, I think it is, or 94% uh, male uh, environment, and leading men in that sense. Uh, so I think it's all about leadership in the end. So there's a, this role uh, leading such a big factory with such a high level of innovation. Uh, it requires you to take charge and to connect to the people who work there because these people are fantastic. They have so much know-how, they have so much insight, so much experience. So uh, they are great, but they want to connect to the leaders of the factory as well. And they like to know who they work for. So take charge, be visible, connect with the people. That is for me the most important thing. And then listen to what they tell you and, and do something with it, act with it. And that is a way to, to change things. And I think men can do that to your point <laughs> as, as women can. But I do think that most women can do that a little bit better than most men. At least that is what I see in my uh, environment. And uh, yeah, then there is other stuff that I can do as being a leader, which I also do. So I coach and mentor a lot of women in ASML because mm. quite often there's hardly any role models over yeah. there and they're struggling with the most 
you know, a wide variety of different topics, how to deal with, you know, having a family or how to deal with uh, having a, a male manager who is totally not aware of his own bias and they come up with all sorts of questions mm -hmm. and try to help them and inspire them. So that, that are things that I can do and all, uh, I also do quite often. That, that's really inspiring. You work uh, um, uh, for the factory and you, you ha are the, the leader, the manager of a lot of people, as you yeah. said, mostly men. Yeah. Um, do you also feel the bias against you from them? Yeah, not so much, I have to say, because they, they of course, I think that it goes with any new leader, you will be tested. <laughs> and in ASML, you're typically tested on uh, the knowledge that you bring to the table. Uh, and then, yeah, of course, can you, are they willing to follow you? We saw your video on the first follower. Th this, is, this is typically what pe how people judge leaders, uh, at least my experience. And that is also how they judge me. And maybe it takes a bit more time for them to, beyond their bias, realize that also a woman can have know-how and can have followers. But it doesn't take too long. So usually after a couple of, I don't know, in some cases weeks, months, uh, maybe sometimes a bit longer, they come to understand that, uh, that, it, that it works. Mm. Yeah. I think one thing that yeah. is really key to build on that is, is if you talk about leadership, it's about authentic leadership. Yeah. Um, um, as we try to change the women, don't change, but find your inner strength. Because I find that whatever meeting and environment you're in, if you dare to be authentic and you kind of step into your strength, you can't be pushed over. It's really tough yeah. to be push people over that are authentic. So find your inner strength and authenticity, which I think is really crucial to stay, you know, to stand up for who you are and what you bring and even if we don't consciously experience bias i think um, um the picture that you used we also use it often to, to talk about equity so how do we create a similar starting point and where we see women progressing less is that research is showing that um, um, uh, uh, typically, uh, the in-group is promoted over their potential and the out-group, which women often belong to, and especially in tech, they're a minority, but also across leadership, um, they are promoted over their accomplishments. And, and I think that already shows you that you might be slow tracking. So if you want to get diverse talent up the ranks, you have to pull them up to create equity because there is so much happening in our brain that's already there as of age six that we have to be cautious about this. And, and, and if we stay conscious and become conscious and work with it, I think that's where we start to make progress. But authenticity is really uh, something that I would urge every diverse leader and even not diverse leader, like every every leader to be, because mm -hmm. I think that's what people are looking for. How people did you find your uh, authentic self as a leader? Um, I think through life. So um, it's work and life, right? You go, you go through, through highs and lows in life. And, um, and, and even if um, one example is um, how I used to present. So I, I worked for Nike like um, at, at some time ago. And, and that's where I learned more of like the, the power presenting. And in the end, someone else in another company said to me, so you're already a good presenter. Why should you do this? And, and I, I, st I start to make it smaller and smaller and smaller. And guess what? It's more impactful. Mm -hmm. So if you say authentic, you know, it's not about introvert or extrovert. It's really about finding what, what makes you tick and what you're passionate about. And that's always a combination of like, you know, life and work, I would say. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you feel differently. No, I think it, 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 it relates very much to trust. Eh? So authenticity is, can I trust this person? If, if, if it's about feeling who are you? And if you look from one side, you see the same person as, as if you look from the other side. And I think that is not only true for leaders, I think it's true for complete brands, for complete mm -hmm. companies. I don't think you can have a non-authentic way of presenting yourself no. on the market because people will just say, it's, it's not you. It's, it, we don't believe sure. in you if you all of a sudden try to be that. Yeah. But I think people are authentic because they are who they are. Eh? Yeah. But the question is, do they feel comfortable enough to be authentic in the place where they are at a certain point in time. Yeah. Which can be in your company or in, in a meeting. Do you feel free enough to <laughs> Do you be feel yourself? free enough? Yeah. And this is something that I think leaders can make a huge difference. So how do you secure in a management team, for example, that you create an atmosphere that people feel comfortable enough to bring themselves to the table with their authenticity and then you have a chance to getting 
really all the ideas and insights on the table. How do you make sure people feel comfortable enough to do that? Now, for example, I've now been leading this factory for a year and I made quite a few changes in the management team of the factory. And a couple of months ago, I had the new team, <laughs> so to say, for the first time all together in one room. And basically my first plea to them was, you don't need to prove yourself in, in this setting, in this new team, because the fact that you are here is already... You are here because you're good enough to be here. So can we just <laughs> not try to prove ourselves? Really not need it. So be... That's nice to skip yeah. that part. Yeah, can we just try to get it over with? Which okay. is... I don't think it, uh, it doesn't always work like that, of course, in every team. But, but I think it helps a lot if a leader confirms that everybody is uh, welcome. Yeah, and is appreciated for what they bring to the table. That's a good one. Yeah. Also, you you uh, immediately make everyone equally important. Yeah, right. Because this is with diverse team. Eh? So I brought, uh, let's say, somebody with uh, who is a lot younger and has less experience to a senior position in a management team. Uh, and there was somebody who has a completely different background in that management team. So we changed that quite a bit. And there's also difference in, in job grades, which is unfortunately also still a big theme. So how do you get real diversity outcomes out of that team if there are all these sorts of different, <laughs> let's say, starting points for the different people? Yeah. So you have to be open about address it, and then you have a chance that it comes out. Yeah, someone's also saying uh, that the staying authentic, uh, a lot of people agree with that as well. Um, I would like to talk more about role patterns. Uh, I named this part of the conversation being a mom and being a boss. Mm. Uh, and um, because Sheila, that, that's for example, it's also you, right? Yeah, right. So I have two uh, young adults, I would say. They are 18 and 20 years mm. by now. And uh, uh, yeah, I think it's... Uh, and a couple of things to say about th this one. First of all, you need to be lucky enough that everybody is in good health. Eh? So I think when, when there is a problem somehow, yeah, you can probably not make the choices that I was able uh, to make. But, but then, you know, if that is all okay, everybody's in good shape, your partner and your children, and you can, uh, uh, then you can try to make it work together as a family, which requires some, I would say, constant uh, tuning on how everybody is doing. And, and then I uh, come back to the, <laughs> to the bias, because we also have our own bias and ideas about, you know, we should be at home or not at these certain occasions or these certain amount of hours a week or whatever it is. And I learned you have to leave that all behind. You, there's one thing important, you look at how everybody is really doing. And then you adjust your behavior or you make some agreements with your partner or whatever uh, it takes. But don't let yourself be guided by guilt or ideas or judgments from others on how things should be organized. Have you ever felt something like that? Oh yeah, <laughs> a lot. <laughs> yes, yeah, this was 20 years ago. Eh? I think <laughs> I hope we are in a better shape nowadays <laughs> than we were 20 years ago. 20 years ago, there were not so many women who choose to work full time and were having a career and a family. So I got a lot of questions uh, on this. Uh, by the way, hardly ever from men. Mostly from women? Yeah, mostly yeah. because men think it's absolutely normal that you work hard and make a career while you have a family. Yeah. But for women, it's not so uh, normal. Unfortunately, still not. Yeah. How do you then women can be tough <laughs> yeah. to each other. <laughs> yes. They can be even more judgmental than, yeah. uh, than the guys. They go uh, yeah. really head to head. The moms yeah. on the schoolyard asking, uh, oh, you're staying short. Is it that something like that? Well, you, 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 um, you have it at school. I've noticed it, that yeah. there are some indeed, uh, the not working moms at a certain moment, you almost got a division of the yeah. not working moms getting together in all kinds of clubs and doing things at impossible times for us as working women. Yeah. So uh, let's go and play tennis on Thursday morning. <laughs> it's impossible. <laughs> and uh, before you know it, you get a gathering of all the working moms together. And, but but I, I don't like all these kind of little clubs that are being created. So also there I try to be connections with different uh, different types of people and not feel that indeed you're being pushed in a certain yeah. direction. How do you look at the role patterns, for example, in the Netherlands? When we look at men and women and the vision about what they should do? Um, I think it's changing. 
And um, if, I, if I look at some of the more Scandinavian countries, I think they, they might be further ahead because I think still it's a discussion point here uh, in the Netherlands. Um, if you are indeed working full time, if you make certain choices on, on how you balance your family life. I have two daughters, they're uh, 10 and 11, almost 12. Um, and I think if you get, go a step further, so I had a colleague from Sweden, and she felt it was a non-issue anymore. So this thing that yeah. you refer to, like the other women are looking at you like, why are you doing this? Um, and I'm trying to do that in my own sub-bubble, so with my team. And um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm heading up the marketing team. So by default, also there we have issues because there's more women mm -hmm. uh, than men. Um, but there I'm trying to really kind of make it very clear to the women in the team to say, okay, choose your own style when you work, when you don't work. If yeah. your child has something going on during the day, I'm fine. I'm, I'm judging you on your outcome and not on whether you're sitting behind your computer at three o'clock in the afternoon. So um, I'm, I'm trying to make that normal, the flexible hours, the flexible way of, of looking at what they're doing. I don't think we're completely there yet in, in the Netherlands. Yeah. No, I think there we also have a task to fulfill, not only as uh, leaders, but also as parents. Uh, that we uh, set an example towards our children and, and uh, you know, the way we, we, we grow them up as uh, how they look at equality. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I have very interesting discussions uh, sometimes with my own children, 18 and 20. Of course, they are in the midst of their, uh, yeah, let's say, discovering the world and also talking to their friends uh, who also have certain views on how the world is working or should work. It's pretty amazing what you still come across. Uh, so I think we also have a responsibility not only to, uh, to work in our working environment or be in sessions like this to make a change, but also to make a change ourselves and how we uh, educate our children. To normalize it yeah. yep. at home. Uh, Astrid, how do you look at this? You're also a mom? Yeah, of two teens who are so sick and tired of being at home 24-7 with their parents. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge, I would say, but also a great opportunity. So um, uh, the challenge is that, to your point, everybody needs to find their own rhythm. Mm. And I like the word rhythm because we also need to move, right, in during the day. So we have to find a different rhythm that works for us and suits our lifestyle. We have to lead with trust because you can't control this anymore. It, leadership is about trust and inspiring your people to do the right thing and empowering them more than controlling and checking on them because everybody's finding their own rhythm. Um, I think being together has been has brought its pluses and its minuses. It's not been easy. Um, and also they're way behind in school, so that brings challenges. And if you then say, is the Netherlands, we, we, are, we are behind. We are more traditional. Um, we are more in denial of being biased because we're perceived as a tolerant society. So, it's yeah. society, yeah. so we think, oh, we don't discriminate. We don't, we are not biased. Yeah. So we have a fairly closed mindset compared to some other cultures and countries. Um, and therefore we're lagging behind a bit in the openness to actually learn about this and do it, do it better. Um, Indeed, when I was um, uh, young in that sense, um, I also got the question, why do you even have children, right? Very mm. blunt, very Dutch. Mm -hmm. um, and <laughs> I think we're now moving into the time, like let, let everybody find their own way, right? And if you want to be at home or need to be at home full time, that's fine. I think if you choose to work, find your own rhythm and never feel bad about it. And please don't start working part time because you want to have the right to not pick up the phone. I did that, I, for a time, I a short time I worked 90% because at least you can actually legitimately kind of like not be available. A lot of women do this. They go back to like 90, 80 percent, mm -hmm. but they still work 120. Yeah. Yeah. So don't do that. Just go for, yep. you know, full pay, but really also um, arrange it in a way that it suits you and have certain blocks where you are available. And, and that's all. that Evita was also talking about. Hugely important. Mm -hmm. And we can. And that's the opportunity we have now with COVID and hybrid working. Yeah, because especially with COVID, I think uh, yes. it's... it's uh, um, the importance of, of finding uh, the right balance is, is 
more in the spotlight, at least. Yeah, and, and there is no thing as a right balance, right? One day you're like this, and the other day you're like that, because it's it's rarely like this, like perfect, especially when you're still growing in your career. It goes like this, which is fine, but just learn to work with it, that it has <laughs> a certain bandwidth. Yeah. Uh, but the opportunity is now here for not just women, but also for men, and a lot of the young men bring more feminine traits um, that are also open and willing to do more at home, right? Mm. So I think also there are opportunities now, even with maternity leave, to say, do you want to take you work from home? Which day can we combine certain elements? Um, so there are also for individuals and for couples um, opportunities um, to actually shape it in a way that it suits you and your partnership and your life to say, how are we going to arrange this? Because we're in the era of hybrid and we're shaping it as we speak. So now is the time to really make this happen. Oh. I see this a lot at ASML. Uh, there's a lot of young fathers, <laughs> I always call them, who choose to work, you know, four days a week and, and uh, or who don't mind saying, hey, I have to leave this meeting because <laughs> I have to pick up my kids yeah. or whatever. And is it respected? And it is respected, absolutely. And I think it's great because it mm. was not like this 20 years ago, but it is like this. Now it's the example we give yeah. also. So as a leader, when you also do that, so yesterday I was going to the hairdressers for my hair today. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, and we actually had quite some important things to discuss. And, and so I needed to postpone a meeting to, to 6.30, yeah. which is normally kind of I want to respect that time also. But I was just open about it. So I, I have this presentation tomorrow. I'm going to be at the hairdressers. And, um, and, and, and I explicitly say that to also tell people it's OK. Yeah. There's things you need to do during the day yeah. which are also important for you. And ultimately, yeah. all of these things make you a better person and, and a better professional yeah. to indeed bring your whole self to work. Yeah, and you look at the outcome, what you said. Exactly. So yeah. So yeah. that's interesting. Yeah. Um, so so it, it's getting, it's changing, a, as you were all saying. Uh, but for example, last week I read the, uh, a Dutch newspaper and they were talking about the possible successor of Angela Merkel. And the, mm. the headline of the article was, can a mother with two small children run a big country like Germany? <laughs> and when I read it, I was like, Oh my God! Seriously, <laughs> <laughs> Bias Bias also everywhere. got lots of uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah comments. So it's it's, it's still children. a thing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It's very much a thing. Look, even at the candidacy when uh, Rob Jette was running for a party, he was perceived as the young high potential leader and there were two a bit like senior, maybe old women, right? So it's like really interesting how it's this is ingrained very deeply in our society, like in our children's books, in educational materials, yeah. in the media, in the journalists. So that's why I say it's not to be fixed like to say, okay, get rid of bias. It's here. Yep. But if it's here, how can we address it and reduce the space? and become more aware because maybe 10 years ago you wouldn't have thought with that headline oh my but now you're thinking oh my and I think many people with you have thought oh my yeah. Yeah. so I think that that is that is indeed the game but we have to make uh, people around us and keep making them aware and that's where we often say inclusion starts with I we all need to play our part so if you have a team meeting and you see these things happening then make it a team dialogue in the end work with your team to say where can what can we do to improve um, inclusion. What can we do to reduce the space for bias together? Can we address it? Can we talk about making mistakes? Can we ta talk about differentiation? And especially in the Netherlands, we have this blind spot that equal means the same. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you want to be truly inclusive, you need to differentiate. And that is something where, you know, also with the Dutch culture, that's something that needs extra attention, the differentiation element. Yeah, yeah so I think specifically, and you mentioned yeah. the word tolerance before. And, and it seems to be when you talk about, oh, we're such a tolerant country, as if it talks about freedom. And if it talks yeah. about, oh, everything is okay for us because we're so tolerant. But as soon as you make a verb out of it, so to tolerate, I tolerate you, and I had it also on one of my slides, yeah. mm. you all of a sudden feel the pain. Like, okay, I tolerate that you sit on that chair. Yeah. You go like, who the... <laughs> are you to <laughs> say, okay, yeah. you know, th then this power distance become very yeah. I I I explicit. And I think that's... As long as we still feel like, okay, I tolerate people with different cultures here, or I tolerate this woman in this position, as long as she's still kind of taking good care of her children, and ooh, can yeah. it all happen? Yeah. So that's something we need to be extremely careful about, specifically here in the Netherlands, where we carry this, this notion of tolerance very high. Mm -hmm. It has this sharp edge to it.
Yeah, interesting. Um, later we're going to talk more about how uh, can we ch change the, the more. Uh, but let's go to the video of Samira Rafaela. She is the European from the European Parliament, um, a member for the party D66, and she's a big fighter for women's rights. And she made a video in Brussels for us uh, about this topic. So let's watch it. Hello to you all. Thank you for inviting me to speak at the Female Tech Heroes Conference about diversity and equality. It remains important that we discuss these topics because although we are making progress, the pace is too slow. And especially within the tech sector, there is plenty of room for improvement. In the European Parliament, advancing the position of women in the tech sector is a major priority. The EU aims to improve investments in formal and informal education, lifelong learning and vocational training specifically for women. Through programs such as InvestEU, we want to stimulate gender smart financing to empower and inspire female business founders. One of the biggest challenges overall today is that women are consistently underrepresented in leadership roles. And this issue is even more pressing within the tech industry. Young engineers can look up to iconic figures like Steve Jobs, Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, while female role models are not so well known. And as a woman, I have experienced how a lack of role models can be a discouragement if you want to achieve something in life. And it is of vital importance that young people can create images of relatable individuals whose success seems attainable. And in order to break through existing gender norms, gender diversity has to be at the core of hiring strategies. Diversity in organizations is often a matter of commitment and willingness to invest. Arguments like we did not receive any applications from women are no longer sufficient. We have to demand more from companies. Without wanting to ignite a debate on quota for women in top positions, we do see that progress is too slow and that voluntary measures and targets have had limited success in the past. And I believe this illustrates that we have to consider binding measures to enforce gender parity on company boards. We also need to redesign our social, social systems and labor markets so that everyone feels free and encouraged to participate. It means we have to rethink the burden of unpaid care at home and redefine traditional gender patterns. I believe politicians have a responsibility in providing the frameworks to facilitate this change. For instance, by paying men and women equally for equal work so that we can finally close the gender pay gap. We must facilitate flexible working arrangements and expand parental leave to support a better work-life balance for both parents. To, to conclude, equality does not always mean treating everyone the same. It also means taking into account the inequalities that certain groups face in this society and acting accordingly. Parity is powerful. The time is now for policymakers and business leaders to step up and make it a reality. Thank you and have a great conference. What do you think? I think the, on, in the high tech uh, world, uh, like uh, I think ASML is, is uh, yeah, maybe in that sense the most extreme uh, player in, in high tech you, you could probably think of. I also worked in Philips, so it is a bit of a different world or world on its own. I do think we have a huge problem with the education already. So if we look at the pond that we can fizz in uh, to, uh, to find women, it's uh, not so big, especially not in the Netherlands. That is why we hire a lot outside of the Netherlands and we have, uh, as a result of this, uh, a hugely diverse workforce, which is fantastic in terms of nationalities. And most women that I see in my factory, they come from different countries, uh, Portugal, for example, or Eastern Europe, or India. And so I think it all starts with the education programs. So how do we get more girls into high-tech studies? And then they can also be in high-tech companies. And uh, Samira also talked about the policy, right? Uh, what the, the role of politics in, in this whole story. Evita, what do you think of that? What, what can we expect from, from politicians, for example, in this? 
Yeah, I think um, role modeling, as we also talked about before, I think that remains an extremely important element uh, so that you see women also in certain positions without losing their femininity. So because uh, as talked about, you don't want a, a yellow tulip, uh, to follow my uh, metaphor, uh, to present a certain image because then you feel, okay, I need to also become more masculine as a woman to be, uh, to be a leader. So I think uh, to have a proper proper role models is extremely important, and also to make sure that we keep striking that balance between, um, because quota is always a thing. As eh? so we had this this um, saying at a certain moment, when there is a will, there is a way, and when there is not a will, there is a vet. Uh, yeah. You know, a yet bigger marker. Yeah. yeah. And um, we have to be careful with the quota side of things. So we talked about quota target settings, but it should be, Mindy, as you mentioned, it should be a lagging indicator. So you look because you do all the right things for your business to grow and then at a certain moment you look at your measure and you say ah now we're at 20 percent or now we're at 30 percent so it, it provides you the evidence of what you've done kind of um, uh, where you are in that whole road but not that being a target on itself mm -hmm. i think that could be uh, and i think in politics we need to uh, make sure we we don't take that step too far and then you hire fake red tulips that actually show yellow behavior because that fits the norm. Yeah, and 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 for example, um, she talked about the flexible hours, but also childcare solutions. Is that a, a solution to make it more equal? For example, if women go with pregnancy leave, men ha ha are, are getting off too, or are, the, are those solutions to make it more equal? Yeah, to me, I would say uh, I think every individual should have the opportunity to make work the best for them personally. And it's, it's like you said, to make every individual at the table also feel respected. And it, it might be over the gender axis, but um, um, also, I mean, you, you can have a household with two women and one is pregnant and then the other woman, I mean, because she's a woman, does she get pregnancy leave? Or does she get like the same arrangement as a father? Uh, how does that work? Yeah. Mm. So uh, you want to look at the individual. What does that person need? And not specifically to say, okay, you're a woman, you do get pregnancy leave, or oh, you didn't get pregnant, so now what? Yeah. So it's it's. Yeah. I think we need to look at it more from the individuals rather than big statements. Okay, we need to fix this for the genders. We need to fix that for people that have di different sexual orientation. It, it 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 also has a scary edge to it. Yeah, I can yeah. imagine. Someone is also asking, um, uh, someone is saying, my boss literally told me after returning to for maternity leave, I found you a less demanding project. I didn't want it, but I was forced to. <laughs> so that's, that's not very good. <laughs> no. And someone else is also saying, and not all companies, t you talked about the flexible hours, right? You're open about it. Uh, but some, some say, yeah, how do you deal with that if my company doesn't tolerate it? Uh, and that I might be losing some opportunities because competition, men don't, don't usually ask for flexibility in many cases, is someone saying. But that's where the role of politics does come in for me. So what they do is provide like a baseline and a safety net for everyone to realize that we're making steps here. And that's where a quotum in itself, for the sake of a quotum and a, and a goal, is never going to work. But as part of a broader strategy, yes, because it's still the language that some of the people in our society speak, so it helps. And the same for politics. If they actually look now at, for example, remote working and will help companies that you can work from any place, right? And because we're still so divided also globally and even within Europe. And if they would help us to align some of these policies and all guiding towards equality, equity, um, and, and, and allowing for differentiation, but also working from different locations and making that easier for companies to facilitate, that helps. And the same for flexibility, for maternity leave. So I think all these things, they're not making the difference as one thing, but together pol the politicians play an, a really vital role in enabling societies and, and all stakeholders, companies included, to really make progress in this area. And that's where they can actually build the found help build the foundation. Evita, what do you think of this? Yeah, I was actually still digesting the other topic that you mentioned uh, uh, yeah. in the chat. I wanted to ask one question to that person that, yes, of that, course. that got this less demanding project. Eh? Yeah. Um, because a very powerful question that she could have asked her manager would have been, why do you 
considered is. Ja. En dan in that way, the, let's say the bias awareness ja. would have gone up because he's probably I assume it's a he. I might be <laughs> might be uh, my bias as well. It, it it says my boss, so I don't know. Yeah, yeah I also <laughs> don't know. But but let's say the boss in this case uh, probably had the best possible intention. Yeah. I was thinking, well, uh, let's uh, let's say create a good environment for this person, but it's totally not what this person needs. Apparently. Well, you never know. It, it, you maybe don't know. she does need it. Yeah, and I think being open and asking, uh, yes. as long as it doesn't become like, oh, I gave you a, a less demanding project yeah. because I don't think you're up to it. Yeah. But but proposing, like maybe, you know, you want to have a less demanding project because you slowly want to get into it, yeah. it because it is a life-changing event. Yeah. Maybe if, if a guy just lost one of his parents, you might also want to have a manager that says, okay, you're, you, do you want to have less on your plate for yeah. the time being to just kind of digest things. And then somebody should be able to say, no, 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 I want to dive into work because this is a nice uh, way of getting distracted. Or this person might say, yeah, actually, I thanks. Need it. Yeah. Yeah. But when is the suggestion? So I'm, I'm not. Yeah, I, I, let me see. I, I don't get a response yet, but um, it, it's, what, it's what you're saying. It should be more conversation. Should yeah, it's the dialogue. Yes. And like the manager uh, could ask, what do you need from me? to be successful, given the fact yeah. that you just that came back after your maternity leave. Than yeah. Yeah. That, that's yeah. a great question for, for yeah. every manager, I think, yeah. to, to yes. ask to yeah. their employees, right? I How think this I is help? the core that you now mentioned. This is the core of progress, how you can actually as an organization move forward together. Yeah. Like everything we talked about so far, if you want to take it forward within companies, you need that dialogue, and especially with people of the in-group, so the perceived, yeah. whatever that in-group looks like in your company, but I think this is key. Yeah. Asking why and getting Getting to the depth of that conversation to wake people up and become aware. I yeah. think that's that's yeah. really core. Yeah. And yeah. not so easy to achieve. Right? No. <laughs> because I <laughs> see <laughs> this. Yeah, I, I think there's lots yeah. of different leaders also in ASML with different skill sets. And it's not so straightforward that, that they uh, create thing. the atmosphere where you can have this type of conversation. Yeah, because we talk about the new leaders. You talked about the new leadership. Do you think people are ready? Are we ready? I think we, are, we, we need to. We need to be ready. So uh, I think the whole circumstance that we're in as business, as society, uh, we need to embrace this way of, of thinking and working together. Um, so um, yeah, are we ready? We better get ready. <laughs> thank you so much for this conversation. Thank you for your thank time. You. Evita Stoop, thank you. Uh, Sheila Leenders, thank you so much. You're and Astrid Balsink. Thank you so much for joining. It was a wonderful conversation. And uh, I see a lot of responses also in the chat. So uh, people enjoyed it. And uh, it's uh, food for thought. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for watching because this was it. The Female Tech Heroes Conference 2021. And how great would it be next year to see each other here again in the conference center at the Heide campus in real life. With a drink, networking in real life, how great would that be? But for now, I think we had a really amazing online conference. Thank you so much for joining and we hope to see you next time. Thank you. <laughs>